Welcome to the August 10th special meeting of the budget and oversight of public elections committee of the elections commission. Um, this meeting is being held in person at city hall room 416. 1, Dr. Carlton B. Goodlip Place, San Francisco, California, 94102. As authorized by California Government Code Section 54953E and Mayor Breed's 45th supplement to her February 25th, 2020 emergency proclamation, it is possible that some members of the Commission may attend this meeting remotely. Members of the public may attend the meeting to observe and provide public comment at the physical meeting location listed above or online. It Instructions for providing public comment are on the agenda. In addition to participating in real time, interested persons are encouraged to participate in this meeting by submitting public comment in writing by um, uh, 12 p.m. on August 10th to the Commission Secretary. Before we proceed further, I'd like to ask Commission Secretary De uh, Martha Delgadillo, who is acting as our moderator, to explain some procedures for today's remote meeting. Thank you, Chair Shapiro. The minutes of this meeting will reflect that this meeting is being held in person at City Hall, room 4081, Dr. Carlton B. Goodlett Place, San Francisco, California, 94102. It is possible that some members of the Budget and Oversight of Public Elections Committee will join, will join through um, remotely. In addition to partic participating in real time, interested persons are encouraged to par participate in this meeting by submitting public comment and writing by 2 p.m. on August 10th, 2022 to martha.delgadillo at sfgov.org. It will be shared with the commission after this meeting has concluded and will be included as part of the official meeting file. Public comment will be available on each item on this agenda. Each member of the public will be allowed three minutes to speak. Comments or opportunities to speak during the public comment period are available via phone by calling 415-655-0001. Again, the phone number is 415-655-0001. Access code is 2489-943. 7914 again 2489-943-7914 dial by the pound sign and then pound again to join us in an, uh, as an attendee you will hear a beep when you are connected to the meeting you will be automatically muted and in listening mode only when your item of interest comes up dial star three to raise your hand to be added to the public comment line you will then hear you have raised your hand to ask question to ask a question. Please wait until the host calls on you. The line will be silent as you wait your turn. Ensure you are in a quiet location. Before you speak, mute the sound of any equipment around you, including television, radio, or computer. It is especially important that you mute your computer if you are watching via the web link to prevent feedback and echo when you speak. When the system message says your line has been unmuted, this is your turn to speak. You are encouraged to state your name clearly and spell it. As soon as you begin speaking, you will have three minutes to provide your public comment. Six, if you're using an interpreter, you will hear a bell go off when you have 30 seconds remaining. If you change your mind and wish to withdraw yourself from the public comment line, press star three again, you will hear the system say you have lowered your hand. When a phone is not available, you can use your computer web browser. Make sure the participants side panel is showing by clicking on participants on the participants icon. Make sure the participants panel is expanded in the side panel by pressing the small arrow indicator in the panel. You should see a list of panelists followed by a list of attendees. At the bottom of the list of attendees is a small button or icon that looks like a hand. Press the hand icon to raise your hand. You will be unmuted when it is your time for comment. When you have done, when you are done with your comment, click the hand icon again to lower your hand. Once your three minutes have exp expired, staff will thank you and mute you. You will hear your line has been muted. 
Public comment instructions are also listed on the agenda on, at, on the last page. Thank you, Chair Shapiro. Thank you. And with that, I will call the meeting to order. Um, Secretary Delgadillo, would you please proceed with item one, the committee roll call? Okay. Uh, Chair Shapiro? Present. Commissioner Bernal? I'm sorry. Commissioner Jordanic? I'm sorry. Here. Commissioner Dye? Here. Okay. With three in attendance, we meet quorum. Thank you. Um, and let's move to agenda item number two, general public comment, public comment on any issue within BOPEC's general jurisdiction that is not covered by another item on this agenda. Secretary Delgadillo, are there, is there any public comment? No problem. Yes, Mr. Brent Turner would like to comment. Oh, here we go. Kind of strange. Okay, I will unmute Ms. Well, we have two callers. I don't know who raised your hand first, but Mr. Turner, you are unmuted. You have three minutes to comment, and this is on general comments. Thank you, Martha. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and thanks, commissioners. I just wanted to give a brief general comment um, as to um, open source voting system work that's gone on previous within BOPEC as well as the Elections Commission. I noted it was not on the agenda this evening, although there are um, bullet points on the agenda that I think have some um, relation to open source. I just wanted to put firmly on the record that the um, public appreciates the open source technology advisory committee that was also working, I believe, within BOPEC and subject to the oversight of BOPEC. Um, we, we hope that this becomes part of regular agenda. Um, for those that don't know, we started working on this uh, right around 2000 and with San Francisco um, a few years later, but we've been working with San Francisco County with the hopes that we would lead the country toward these um, more transparent voting systems that inspire the public confidence. Our initial concern back before 2016 was that we would have election systems that were impenetrable. And um, as we know from our country's recent history, there um, was some allegation regarding Donald Trump's election as we saw some uh, outside country folks um, inside the voting systems around the software. So that's why this work with, uh, especially now that we see the news of the day um, and the peril that our country is in, it is even more crucial that any moment we have in San Francisco to show leadership around open source systems that we continue that effort. And I want to thank BOPEC and the commissioners in general for their good work in this area. Thank you. We do have another caller. Okay. Okay, caller, you are unmuted and you have two minutes to comment on general public. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great, uh, David Philpel. So, um, just a technical issue. I can hear the three commissioners up on the dais. Uh, I heard Mr. Turner a moment ago, but I can't hear Martha as well. Which is very sad for me. Um, so, if you could uh, pull the mic closer to you, or be sure that uh, we're not just getting the ambient sound from the room. What Martha says is just as important as anybody else, and I want to be sure I get it. Uh, more for fun later. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Okay, I will. I just need to clear the uh, the hands up. Okay, I don't see any other callers waiting to comment. Great. Let's move to 
Um, item number three, discussion and possible action on resolution and continuation of remote elections commission meetings. Um, does anyone, is anyone open to making a motion to continue? I move that we adopt the um, resolution that's attached to the packet. Second. Great. Um, do we need to take public comment? We do. Okay. Um, Chair Shapiro, how do you vote? Um, public comment. I think we have to take oh, public, public comment. comment. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, I didn't unmute you. I didn't mute you. Did you say that? How are you on? David. David oh. Pell. That's so weird. He is the one. I will go ahead and unmute him. Okay. Uh, David Pell Pell, thanks. A um, couple of things um, on this. Since you're already there, I guess it's fine to uh, pass this. Um, I note that under the mayor's 45th supplement, subcommittees of um, the specific name charter commissions are not required to meet in person at this time, and those commissions may decide whether to require in-person meetings of such subcommittees. Um, I think it would be prudent if you have further special meetings or whatever, any meetings of OPEC at this time, I think it would be better to uh, simply meet uh, remotely. I think that there are increasing health risks for all of us. And although the full commission has to meet in person, subcommittees don't. And I think it would be better for all concerned uh, not to until further notice. Nevertheless, on the resolution itself, um, on the bottom of page two, I believe the resolve uh, clause should say that the Elections Commission budget and oversight of public elections Commi committee finds as follows. Um, and then on the second resolve, THEE -E should be THE. And again, um, Elections Commission budget and oversight of public elections committee and in the third resolve as well. This is the standard reso from the full commission meeting. Um, and should be customized to be specific as to BOPEC because it does not uh, specify BOPEC anywhere in it, according to Mary. Um, other than that amendment, I think it's fine to adopt the resolution before you know. Thanks for listening. Are there other public comments? Any other public comments? You all, I'm sorry, I don't see any other hands raised. Great. Um, so just to quickly respond, I know we have a, a motion to vote on, but um, I did inquire about the language and whether any changes needed to be made specifically for BOPEC with the city attorney. And I was advised that um, we do not need to make any changes. So okay. just as context. And then I think we can move forward with the vote. Okay, should I call roll now? Okay, Please. so Chair Shapiro, how do you vote? Yes. Commissioner Giordani, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Dye, how do you vote? Aye. All right, with three ayes, the motion passes. Great. And let's move to item number four, approval of previous meeting minutes, discussion and possible action to approve minutes for the January 28th, 2020 BOPEC meeting. I move that we adopt the draft minutes. Second. You, let's see. I, I don't see any hands raised for uh, public comment. Okay, so let's move to a vote. Yes, okay. Okay. Chair Shapiro, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Giordani, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Dodd, how do you vote? Aye. Okay, thank you. With three in the, the affirmative, the draft for the January 28th BOPEC meeting passes, the draft meeting minutes. Sorry about that. Wonderful. So, moving right along, um, item number five, racial equity discussion and possible action regarding equity considerations for the commission and department of elections. So I'll kick this off. Um, 
originally I had anticipated wanting to discuss the progress report that um, the director shared with us uh, the, of the progress toward the city's requirements for racial equity. Um, and as I continued on the process of reading through everything, um, namely the requirements outlined by the city, uh, the mayor's memo, it occurred to me that, um, in fact, it is tra challenging for us to impose specific things or suggest specific things when we as a commission ourselves maybe haven't talked about it from our, for our own commission. Um, and so I, I hope that you had the chance to read some of um, the work because my goal is to, um, rather than outlining a plan for equity, more have a discussion about the considerations that the city has outlined for departments um, that I think that we can apply in the context of how we operate as a commission. Um, and specifically um, thinking about how we are centering our work around, um, I don't know, repairing the harm. So specifically on page eight of the, um, map, the Office of Racial Equity uh, attachment, um, the, the, there's a section called the true measure. Um, and the true measure of any plan is in its results. Um, so it specifically asks, are black American Indian and people of color employees better off? And this kind of centers all of the work around any type of plan um, and that that plan should seek, you know, tangible outcomes, tangible change. And when I looked at what we, what the mayor had outlined in terms of the objectives for the index and the issue areas and indicator criteria, I noticed that voting in elections was not on the list. Um, and so I wanted to talk through as a, as a commission or as a committee rather, some of the areas using the framework that the city has provided that we can start to adopt or consider as a group that can hold ourselves accountable to some equity priorities. Um, and the reason I did not want to outline a plan specifically is that, as you may notice from some of the readings, um, uh, there's an, uh, quite an emphasis on co-creation. And so I, while I do have ideas of ways that we can think about this, um, I'd like to have it be more of a conversation. Um, and so the way I'm really thinking about this is today we can talk about part one, which is the commission level, you know, how we operate, what our considerations are, um, and um, more in commission specific. But then part two can be how are we then uh, thinking about how we're supporting the department itself and the policies that we are prioritizing. So, um, with that, I, I'll kind of take a pause and see if there are any immediate questions or thoughts about my um, what I've shared thus far. Well, I, I think that sounds fine. I mean, I'm, I think it's worth discussing. And I like how you divide it up in the two, can have kind of two parts to it. Yeah, I think it's actually a good point. Uh, I, I wouldn't expect, you know, voting to be called out specifically, uh, but I would expect civic engagement to mm -hmm. be called out. And I don't see that specifically called out anywhere. Although I think it could be argued that it, it could be incorporated in some of these other topics. Certainly some of the uh, issue areas to come that were identified co by community groups, for example, you know, youth and older adults looking at civic engagement for those demographics, for example. Um, so I think that would be worth thinking about. It's like where where does the department's focus fit in to the uh, indices that the city is proposing? So the I think my and open to discussion, but my proposal is that we start by looking at our own mm -hmm. commission and the things that we prioritize. So a few things I thought of mostly in the context initially about how our discussions around the redistricting task force 
And it occurred to me that many of the things that we were discussing didn't weren't actually reflected in our commission itself. Um, so specifically qualifications, um, differences in how uh, we were all, each appointed to uh, the commission by our appointing authority. Um, do we represent communities of interest? Are we compensated for our work? And is that an equitable approach? Um, things like that Im immediately stood out to me as um, things that are important. And one thing I will add that I'm, I'm hopeful was kind of extracted from some of the reading material is that status quo isn't necessarily going to deliver on change. Um, and so I think this was really an opportunity for us to throw things at the wall and say, what do we think we can do to better reflect the communities that we serve? Um, in fact, San Francisco is is um, a minority majority city, but yet our commission is primarily white. And how are we thinking about that in the context of the communities that we're supporting and the prior and the policies that we are prioritizing? These are just questions that I think are important that we talk about. Um, and I'm happy to note take and, and start to put a plan together, but I, I feel that it should be a shared discussion around how we can improve our um, our commission for the for centering this better. So I made a comment at the previous meeting that the challenge is that we ourselves have no control over this and and the appointing process and what criteria each appointing authority, uh, you know, chooses to apply. Uh, I know that you know, given that we're down several commissioners, that I have. You know, strongly encourage people in my network to look for candidates of color uh, that, you know, would represent other communities in the city, not currently represented by the commissioners who are left here. Um, but outside of that informal uh, kind of admonition, you know, I, I think this is actually an issue with commissions in general. That there's not a, you know, a central appointing authority that has some criteria around, uh, you know, racial equity or diversity and inclusion in general. So there's no way to, you know, this is the, as you pointed out rightly, this is exactly the challenge with the redistricting task force as well is that it's got multiple appointing authorities, none of which communicate with each other. Or at least they're not required to. Um, no standardized criteria and um, outside of a general statement that certain appointing authorities need to appoint members who are broadly representative of the public, there's nothing more specific than that. Well, I have a couple comments. Um... Number one, on the appointing authority thing, I think one one possibility might be, and maybe this is already disseminated through um, certain channels within the government, but if we made it easier for appointing authorities to see what our current composition is, and that way they don't have to guess, and they could say, oh, look, there's such and such percentage of these kinds of people, and they could make a better um, you know, Choice. decision. So I know there is like there's a com a commission on um, I, I don't want to get the name wrong the commission on the status of women is mm -hmm. that is that correct mm -hmm. and they have a a report they issue each year with mm -hmm. the different um, percentages of things I'm not sure 100 percent if it covers race as well as gender okay it does but um, but we could still provide something more up to date from their report and then the other thing is like. It, it would be worth discussing what we should do, given the appointees we have, the members we have. And two things that occur to me are, um, number one, if we made a, more of an effort to get feedback from certain communities, and I'm sure there's many ways that we could do that, ranging from holding our meetings in certain places, or if like we individually go to certain groups, maybe parcel it out. Um, to make sure that we're focusing on things that 
different communities care about. Mm -hmm. And then another um, possibility is, while we don't have the power to appoint people to this commission, we can actually create advisory committees. And we've done that in the past with the, the open source where we, we um, had members of the public belong to that committee. So we could potentially do something like create a, an advisory committee on racial equity that we invite um, you know, members of the public to apply to. And we would have total control over who's a member of that committee. And they could maybe better position to tell us what to focus on. I love that idea. Yeah, I like that. Um, I just wanted to, thank you. I just wanted to respond to a couple of things. Um, there, there are about a hundred commissions in San Francisco and they all operate differently. Um, but even if they don't necessarily do this already, I don't think that's a reason that we shouldn't. Um, and I actually do think that we can have some control or, or influence on qualification setting. Um, in fact, the charter outlines very, only very broad qualifications, um, and it's only specific to a few of the pointing authorities. And so, you know, even thinking so much as our, our and it's not just representation, it's also how we operate. Um, so, for example, incorporating it into our bylaws that, you know, when we think about fairness as a, like, what criteria are uh, reflective of, you know, fair in the free, fair, functional, equity has to be one of those criteria. Um, and so it's centering more of our work. And I love the idea of thinking about um, maybe even doing our meetings a little bit differently. And, and I think feedback from the communities is critical, um, but ensuring that we are able to get that feedback is, is important. And I do think, you know, we talked about this before in terms of compensation um, and it is in the charter so it is a longer conversation but I do think the fact that this is an a non-compensated uh, commitment makes it more exclusionary to uh, communities that are most affected by some of these policies so specifically if you think about black San Franciscans they make the least amount of money in the city and therefore, being able to designate two to five hours, even attending meetings every month, is a significant burden on top of wanting to be able to have a leadership position on the commission. So I think there are many, many um, implications. And I do think that we could suggest a criteria to the appointing authorities based on perhaps the advisory committee. Um, that, and I also think transparency around data is really important. Um, and it's something that I know even the, the department in their report card, or the report of the last year said that, you know, not lacking granularity in racial composition and, and whatnot, that, that that was an area that needed to be more uh, specifically called out. And I think we definitely can do a better job. Um, one other idea that just came to me is also the notion that you know, in prioritizing this in um, in monthly meetings. So, our, you know, what whether it's asking for reporting around what's happening in the department or a strategic initiative that is, you know, working to involve the communities more. Um, I do think that we can make it more of a of an ongoing priority because it really should be. Um, it you know. I don't, I can't think of anything more important than, um, than the franchise. So were you going to say something? Yeah. So, um, so I really like the really basic idea of just exposing our demographics as a commission, uh, since we're down to four, that should be fairly simple. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we should, we didn't really contribute anything to the report card on the commission. And that is the least that we could do. So I think um, we should provide that information so that Director Arns can include that in the in the department's report, racial equity report. Um, I think we should also suggest that this 
this be done for all commissions and it should be included as part of the commissioner database. So that is the central repository for information. So all it includes now is the name of the commissioner and their terms, but there's no reason why it couldn't include demographic information. That seems like a no brainer. And that seems like something that we ought to suggest. I mean, that HR has that information. So, you know, so it's probably just um, getting, getting permission or whatever privacy issues there might be and resolving that. And that could probably be done across all commissions pretty immediately. So I think that's a, that's a terrific, very simple and impactful suggestion right there. Um, I think, um, uh, I think your other 2 suggestions commissioner Dernonic, are also great, uh, in terms of meeting with community groups. I will say that if we had a more diverse commission, that would happen naturally. And that was 1 of the reasons that the California citizens redistricting commission. It was very obvious, you know, we were picked to be diverse and, it, you know, the public information officer, they completely deployed us that way. So that, you know, people could see themselves reflected in a commissioner when we were talking to them about redistricting. So, so if this commission were more diverse in the 1st place, this would naturally happen. We wouldn't have to work so hard at it. Um, Sorry, just to clarify, when you say this, do you mean meeting with community organizations? That so not the specific members of the commission representing that community, but rather the commission going out and meeting with the community. I'm members. just saying we're if the commission were more diverse, that probably those meetings would be happening more naturally without you know having to be as intentional about it. I'm not saying we shouldn't be intentional. I'm just saying that it's a reflection of the uh of the lack of diversity of this commission, which we have noted. Uh, and then actually, I really love the idea of an advisory committee. I mean, I hadn't thought about it in specific, but I think that's also a, a terrific um, suggestion. Um, I agree with you, uh, President Shapiro, that that fair is probably worth this defining. Like what we mean by it, uh, because I think we. We all know in our heads. Uh, and we assume everyone has a shared understanding of it, but we could be a lot more explicit about it. So uh, it's the main reason, as I've stated, that I feel like we have the mandate to to say something about the redistricting process because it's fundamentally unfair the way that it, mm -hmm. it turned out, right? So I, I also think that's that's great as well. In terms of the um, compensation, for all the same reasons we we set out for the redistricting task force, it applies to us too. And it probably applies to every other commission as well. So I, I think there was some, I'm sure there's some history on this because I know that when I filled out the personnel form, there was an option to check whether we were compensated or not. So, mm -hmm. so clearly some commissions are compensated are. Yep. and most others are not. And so there was probably some sorting algorithm that we are not it's actually in i believe in the charter that we're not um but we did the commission i read i was reading the history of the elections commission sorry i, inter I interrupted you no, no go ahead um just to <laughs> respond to that um the uh the initial composition i mean i mean early in the 20th century um was compensated um, but then that type of commission was eliminated and then not brought back for a while. So it has changed o over time, specific to the elections commission. But there are other commissions that where they are compensated. And in fact, there's actually reading that I will incorporate into our next conversation around this, where commissioners have explicit not elections commissioners, but ex other commissioners in the city expressly stated that it is unfair um, that. It's basically, you know, especially if you're serving as president, it is an enormous amount of responsibility um, and a, an enormous time commitment that um, is ultimately um, labor that's going unpaid. Um, but so I'll share, I'll make sure to share that next time. Yeah, and my guess is 
that the commissioners who are compensated, it's probably based on the expected number of hours. Mm. So I suspect there was some cutoff that the elections commission didn't meet. <laughs> so, um, but absolutely in terms of civic engagement, and we saw this all the time during the redistricting uh, commission is that you know, if you want certain communities of interest to come out, you know, they, they needed grants to get them organized and to get them to meetings and provide transportation. And, you know, there, you know, there are serious challenges um, if you're not in a certain income bracket to be able to participate in civic life, including serving on a commission. So I think it's a, it's a very valid point. You know, even if it's just a modest um, stipend. I love that acknowledgement of transportation. And I think it, it, you know, I come from a position of privilege where I can say, you know, I, you know, maybe my instinct is, oh, well, now there's remote access. Well, many folks don't have easy access to uh, Zoom or WebEx or the internet. And, you know, I, I also. Or a good internet signal. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. exactly what I meant. Um, uh, and, the the other thing I'm just considering is, you know, the once we start talking about a second phase of our policies, how are we looking at communities and their participation in elections and and not just communities of color, but also communities that are most sometimes most affected by elections, for example, the unhoused or the incarcerated um, these communities. Are, are, you know, looking at how we're engaging all the different communities that we're supposed to represent, um, I think is, is, I don't know, I, I just, it's an important angle that I'm glad you brought up. So. Oh, please. Yeah, no, it's a discussion. So, yeah, since we're brainstorming, um, I like, Commissioner Dye, I like the, the suggestion that if we apply this something to ourselves that we can also um, encourage other commissions to do the same. There's no reason that we, we need to limit it to ourselves. But um, that, that kind of made me think that kind of like we're on the road to doing with redistricting task force, we can also suggest um, changes to laws that would affect other commissions or, or just our own commission. So another possibility would be to, we could suggest a charter amendment that maybe um, is more specific about who should be appointed to the elections commission to address some of these issues. And also the compensation issue might may even be able to do via an ordinance. I think I remember seeing in the past couple of years, there was an ordinance, I just randomly saw it where the board was expanding the health insurance benefit to a few more commissions. And I don't, they didn't have to do that through a charter amendment, but um, Maybe that's another avenue. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the health insurance benefit. That was something that, by the way, I didn't know when I signed up for it. It just ended up being a really happy surprise. Um, and it was exactly because I, I asked uh, the DCAs, I, was like, I said, I don't suppose there's any compensation for this. And they're like, oh, no, but you get health benefits. And I'm like, really? So, so I was, as some of you know, very excited about that. Um, and uh, maybe it's just not advertised. So that is something that could be a communications issue as well. That might be a very simple kind of low hanging fruit thing. The other thought I had is that I've been told multiple times that our commission is kind of weird. You know, that we've got so many appointing authorities. And, you know, a lot of commissions, you know, they're one of the challenges I had in my onboarding. And I know, uh, President Shapiro, you probably did as well, is they kept on trying to send my paperwork to the mayor's office because that's what they're used to in DHR. Um, and I kept saying, no, you need to send it to the city attorney because that's my appointing authority. And it, it actually took multiple times to get through because we're kind of a weird commission. So. Um, so I think we have more challenges, uh, in terms of trying to ensure some kind of 
you know, uh, diversity among our commissioners because we have so many appointing authorities, but I do think we are unusual from what I understand. But also, um, Chair Shapiro, I think the idea of having this be a regular discussion topic, I think is a good one. It could be like a standing item that we have or either a standing BOPEC item or, or commission item if, if we had time, but I'm not sure um, one or both of the two. I think um, I think that all makes sense. And I, I, one other thing that I has occurred to me is, um, all of us being on the, the same understanding of equity. So I know in the, um, uh, in the report, they link to some articles. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe we also can identify whether it's a training or, um, priorities looking at, and maybe this is a, an objective of such advisory co committee um, that um, President Jordanic mentioned. Um, but for example, one of the things that the Department of Elections touched on in its report is the culture of belonging. Um, and let me find it. Yeah, organizational culture of belonging and inclusion. Um, and there's a lot of research on how to think about policies, how to talk about work in a, in a more inclusive way. Um, and I'm curious if that's something you all would be open to so that we're all kind of on the same playing field and inc obviously including me that we would kind of collaboratively determine what are the, what are the standard, what's the framework that we're even working within when we're thinking about belonging, inclusion, diversity, representation, equity, um, because, you know, I think it's more than as you were, as you were talking about, um, uh, commissioner die, but more than just the representation, it's, you know, how we operate generally. So, um, I don't know if that's better served in the, a separate advisory committee specific to this, but I do think it would be beneficial for us to all be marching. <laughs> At the beat of the same at the beat of the same drum, if that makes sense. Um, curious, curious what you think about that. Are you suggesting training? Are you suggesting? I mean, I of... think yeah. I mean, I would be happy to. You know, one thing that the city has in its action plan is. Um, accountability, timely, and um, a specific person to be accountable for such things. And I think part of the reason why I didn't want to put forth a plan is this element of co-creation. However, I do think if we're focused on outcome-based initiatives, um, you know, assigning responsibility could be beneficial. So, for example, if I were to take that on, suggesting, you know, a few, whether it's a reading or a training, um, that we all would would get behind um, or, or proposing those, um, that could be something that I take responsibility on for. So whether it's training or just reading or watching something, you know, we do all have to do implicit bias training, but um, it's it's I, I feel we can do more. Um, one one idea is. Um... I mean, I think as we're going to see with an, a later item today, it's easy for us to have a good um, discussions about stuff, but over time, some of the things that we talk about get lost. And um, maybe we could have some kind of a, a page on our website where where we have, you know, linked to like a recommended training that future commissioners should take or and current ones. And also maybe, you know, certain documents or maybe our current thinking on stuff or ideas that we want to pursue just to kind of memorialize the current status of things. So it's, it's things don't get lost. Plus one on that. I, I, I think, it, especially given that our commission has experienced so much turnover recently, 
I was thinking as we were voting on the minutes that Commissioner Dronotic the only one who actually was around for that. So, um, so I think memorializing things, having a standard onboarding for all commissioners, I think all of those are great operational ideas that we should put into practice anyway. So I think having this as part of that, um, I, I would definitely agree. And I do think, uh, and you might you might think this is part two of the discussion, but back to what I was saying about the indices, I do think it's important for us as a commission to kind of point out where we think our commission's work and the department's work is most relevant. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking if you look at the slide that had the kind of issue areas with data, mm -hmm. um, you know, it probably is part of the item community health and wellness, like a measure of community wellness includes civic engagement, empowerment, and, you know, um, it's probably part of criminal justice to deal with the, you know, formerly incarcerated and their ability to, to vote. It might even be part of uh, community wisdom. I'm just kind of looking at these items. And then, like I said, for the issue areas to come, you know, maybe even eventually digital equity when we get to some more um, information on on accessing accessing information about uh, propositions or or what have you. And then, like I said, uh, youth and older adults. I definitely think, you know, we have special targeted populations that we want to ensure that the newly minted voters, you know, get 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 into the habit of voting because, you know, data shows that if you get someone when they're 18, they keep voting. So, um, and likewise, keeping older adults engaged in the electoral process. So, I definitely think there are some items that impinge on our work here and that we should call out and, and think about. One thing I was I was thinking, um, not to add more work onto us, um, but is um, as we're thinking about community engagement and outreach, actually there are two things I wanted to raise. One is, you know, sharing what we're doing on the commission with communities. I was starting to read through the outreach plan that the department does for elections. And, you know, there are some really robust community relationships that we can, you know, we can work with in the context of sharing what we're doing on the commission. Hey, these are the things that are our current priorities. We're reevaluating redistricting. We're um, talking about how to make voting systems more open, accessible, and transparent. And you know, this is why it matters. So whether it's a little newsletter or pamphlet, you know, once a quarter or something like that, having more um, touch points um, is number one. And then the other thing is um, also uh, feedback. I think uh, one thing I would love to think for us to consider is, you know, how we're informing what our strategic priorities are and our special projects are. Um, and this is not to um, say that what we're what is currently being done is wrong. It's just to say, how are we making sure that the work that we're doing on the commission is actually reflective of the public and not just like our interest areas? Um, even though that is important, um, how do we make sure that we're really incorporating the communities who are who are um, who need to be elevated in the conversation? I think that's something that we. Um, might want to think about whether it's a, um, and this was something I was going to think about as the part two, um, is the the feedback on um, on the elections process. But I'm thinking just the policies that we're even discussing, um, and then incorporating that into our annual report. Um, so our annual reports, so having a section that is specifically about how we're advancing equity um, through the elections process. 
and how we're making it more fair. Um, I think, you know, whether that's looking at registration and, and um, actual voting patterns of the communities that are most under resourced, um, you know, all of these things, I think we can probably easily incorporate into our into our daily work it, with obviously not the <laughs> taking on a newsletter is not necessarily easy, but um, I do think that having stronger touch points other than a couple of um, really engaged members of the public um, in our meetings is is just really, really important. So. So I wonder if we want to uh, compile a list of specific um, actions here. Yeah. So, like I said, you know, kind of the no-brainer stuff. You know, providing our demographic information and and gathering that from new commissioners as they join us, um, and making sure that's easily available. Um, and then. To kind of follow up on that and say, how, how can we infect the rest of the commissioners, you know, other commissions and maybe get this information reflected in the. In the commissioner database, you know, so it's just maybe collected as a matter of course, when when new commissioners come on. Uh, Where are you thinking that the demographic information would be included? Because 1 thing I thought I was thinking might be a nice. Um, uh, way to incorporate that is I love the idea of having a page on the website that is. Um, devoted to this work, and perhaps that is where we are including our demographic, our current composition. Um, and so I'm curious if you had a different thought. Um, and then my other suggestion is assigning responsibility for you to help and facilitate getting that into the um, commissioner database. Um, just so there's kind of shared. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that is could have the the most immediate impact, mm -hmm. right? And it affects not just our commission, but other commissions as well. So, um, Secretary Delgadilla is saying that we might have some report in our email. There is. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt or not anything, at all. but please share. Yeah. That information is somewhat put together. Um, it's a report, general analysis of commission and boards. Okay. And it does contain gender. It contains um, mm -hmm. ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I, That's I great. I thought I'd sent this. I yeah, I haven't seen it before. You've this, seen it before. Okay. I have not. This is the. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. This so, is the exact report that um, President Jordanic was talking about. Yes. Had you seen it, Robin? Um, no, I had not read through the entire report. I had read. Oh, okay. Re I'd read articles about the report, but I'm really glad we have this. Um, yeah. So this doesn't seem to actually show the data, though. Mm. They have a list of race and ethnicity by gender, additional demographics. Yeah. So I think as you go through demographics of appointees compared to the San Francisco population, there's there's a lot of uh, statistical and just informational kind of report. Thirty nine pages. Okay, I'm I'm looking at something that's only three, so maybe it's a different. I think it might just be aggregate, aggregate information. Yeah, and we're actually talking about reporting by commission. Um, but it does make sense to look at it as a group because obviously there are only seven members of our commission and other commissions are bigger. And so obviously there's only so much we can do with only seven people. Well, so on this point, I would suggest that maybe one of us, and maybe it could be you, Commissioner Dye, would, would actually reach out to the people that maintain the 311 to find out is that something that like technically can be added, for example. Um, and there might be, um, like I said, there might be some privacy issues and there might be, you know, uh, right. people might need to give permission or something. So, but, so I can understand why it's reported in aggregate, but certainly the commissioner database, I'm not sure who, who maintains that. Actually, Secretary Delgadilla, you might know. I know that when I, when I started, you had to 
work with somebody to add me to the commissioner database? Uh, yes, yes, it's um, Amy. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk with you offline about it, but yeah, I'm not sure which department it is. So, okay, three one one. It is the three one one. Okay. In terms of, so I definitely will put together a list of all of the things that we have discussed today. Um, I just wanted to direct um, the both of you to the um, page 12 of the uh, racial equity action plan executive summary. Um, and I just think that there are a few areas that I want to call out um, in terms of how we can start to think about some of the stuff that we're talking about beyond just kind of tactical items, like not just checking off a box, but really thinking about um, how we can begin to move toward um, a more inclusive um, commission ourselves. Um, and I think the there are a few ones that I wanted to call out. So specifically, um, you know, we talked about the commission makeup, but on the exclusive um, uh, column, the last item says openly maintains the dominant group's power and privilege. So if the majority of the commission is white and, you know, this a commissioner dies specifically, you, you called this out and I think it's extremely important. That's why I asked for clarification is, you know, it means that whatever priorities we have are if they're not uh, facilitated by members of those specific communities who are most harmed, then it means that the dominant power of what policies we're prioritizing are based on the the you know the makeup of our um, of the majority of our commission. Um, and then the next one I wanted to mention is um, symbolic change. Um, under but it's the second point says little or no contextual change in culture policies and decision making. Um, it, that's another item that I just wanted to raise where, um, you know, I think making longer term changes maybe is different from what other commissions are doing. But I think, you know, even so much as changing the demographic transparency across all commissions, we have the, the we have the opportunity to make the city better in how we um, think about oversight. Um, and then identity change, the one I wanted to call out specifically, um, actually there are two. One is begins to develop accountability to communities of color um, and then actively recruits and promotes members of groups who've been historically denied access and opportunity. Um, and so just thinking about those priorities, going back to the list um, of what we prioritize, how we're incorporating, how we're thinking about our own uh, role on the commission, and then structural change, implement structures, policies, and practices with inclusive decision-making and other forms of power sharing of all level of the life and work. Um, so how are we thinking about power sharing? And then the last one is members across all identity groups are full participants in decisions that shape the institution. And I think this is what we can maybe aspire to obviously, um, but I just thought that we could ground whatever we prioritize in terms of, you know, this list of things that we've discussed around some of these, these contexts, just thinking about the current, um, current composition and priorities. Um, and those are just the ones that I feel the strongest about, um, but I'm definitely, you know, only one person. So i um, curious if you all agree, or we can also reassess um, as we continue to have this this conversation. But I do think that we should set specific um, visions of what we want to achieve with racial equity and use the city's framework as our guiding principles. Yeah, I just actually wanted to thank you for including it in the packet because just to highlighted otherwise a lot of people wouldn't see this so mm -hmm. yeah yeah and just in general thank you thank you church up or thank you for um chair shapiro for you know even prioritizing this so i think what i i guess it sounds like in terms of next steps i'll put together a list of what we talked about and also 
for next time the packet from um, the resources on other commissions. And then are we what I guess let's talk quickly about the idea of the advisory um, committee. Is that something that you are suggesting we discuss now? Or I guess that's something we would probably want to share with um, uh, Commissioner Bernholtz as well. Uh, what were your what were your thoughts there? Um, well, I think we can certainly discuss it now. Um, I don't, I'm not sure we should make any decisions on it now, but mm -hmm. just to understand what it entails. Um, but before I, I talk about that, I thought I was thinking, like, I would be happy to research the compensation issue just between now and our next meeting to see what controls that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the advisory committee, it's. Like, we have the power to create an advisory committee and we can set any kind of parameters that we want, you know, who's a part of it. It's not going to be compensated, though, obviously. But um, it is a fair amount of work because we would need to have, you know, structure and application process and outreach. And then we would need to provide them with the resources to have the meetings. And I think, you know, it may fall on Secretary Delgadillo to do that. So it's a, it's a very, it's not an easy thing to do, but it's something we could do. I'll just, oh, please, no, please go ahead. I, I was gonna say, I, I think this is a good start. I think um, capturing, you know, as I said, low hanging fruit that, that we can do easily and kind of start us on the path and also capturing ideas for um, that might take a little bit more to implement and more research and charter amendments or ordinances or may have you know implications beyond just our commission. Like I said, I think our commission's a little it's a little special in the way that we're appointed. Um, but there are other commissions like it and we know the redistricting task force has some similar characteristics. So um, so maybe there's something we could suggest around commissions that do have multiple appointing authorities, for example, and, you know, that there's some kind of coordination that they look at uh, uh, racial equity, um, you know, across the appointing authority. So maybe there's some ideas that we can suggest around that. Yeah, I couldn't find any, any, um, anything. I mean, to be fair, it wasn't. I didn't do a full due diligence on that, but I could not find um, very much as it pertained to commissions and racial equity. And that's why I think taking bold, a bold structural approach um, to how we do things could be really um, powerful. And, you know, even if it's just as much as we are creating criteria for what we want the composition of our of our committee to, or our commission to be, um, or whatever. Even if it's a, if it's a suggestion or embedded into our bylaws, um, I just think we can be creative. Um, yeah. So, what I'm what I'm hopeful that we can do is perhaps you know I'll put together a list of some of the things that we talked about. I think each that'll be mine. I know. Um, uh, President Jordanic, you had said you would look into the compensation and perhaps Commissioner Dye looking into the role of database. Yeah, the database and um, using demographic information and I'll put together this list. But I think it would be great if um, ultimately how we think about the plan um, is a shared um, buy-in <laughs> and, um, and not just one. So I think this is a good starting point and perhaps um, I can um, incorporate this as an, or I'll actually, President Jardonic, if you can incorporate it as an agenda item for the um, for the uh, for the next meeting, I can. I think having more of a discussion and making sure people have time to really read through and think about it um, before we really think about our priorities. 
So there was one item I wanted to to bring up, um, and this might be again part of part two, but let me bring <laughs> it up anyway. Um, so uh, so recently it was, you know, there was a court ruling that that took away uh, uh, the school districts um, the opportunity for immigrant parents to vote in school district elections and in board school board member elections, and. Uh, and that's obviously a inclusiveness uh, measure that the city and county of San Francisco undertook, and now it's, you know, at least for now, it's being blocked. And I'm wondering if um, I know uh, our DCAs are not here, but I'm wondering if there's any update on what the city's planning to do about that. And Director Arns, if you know. Yeah. So on the the city's preparing an appeal. On the Superior Court decision that uh, ruled that the Constitution's requirement that voters must be citizens uh, invalidates the city's ordinance or uh, charter amendment and ordinance and, and related ordinances uh, allowing certain non citizens to cast ballots or vote in Board of Education elections. So this, the city is preparing a, 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 an appeal, and I think they're, the city is trying to, to, to develop a, an emergency stay. Mm. Appeal so that the that the that non citizens could vote it's still in the November election. It's a matter of timing, though, for when the decision would, would come down if if the state did um, was uh, granted. So we're we're working with the city attorney's office and, and, and my part of the declaration of the court and any filings that the that the city attorney has. Um, so it's a matter of timing. I don't want to talk about anything really more. Um, but yeah, the city is going to take action in response. So. Great. That's good to hear. Awesome. I think I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up commissioner Dai, because I feel that we can definitely incorporate our stances on things. I actually was really appreciative in president Jordanics um, and 1 of the, in his very robust report, um, to read about, um, the article that you and former commissioner. Uh, Mogi and um, and uh, Commissioner Hill had had shared in the media. I, I don't know if it was SF Standard or Cron. I can't remember. Um, but I think that you know we can take us we can take a stance as it pertains to free, fair, and functional. Absolutely. Um, so I I definitely love that idea of incorporating that into plan phase two or whatever we want to call it long term. <laughs> um, it, it I think it's great. And I'm glad to hear that about the city. Do we do we want to um, since we're here today? Do we want to uh, um, make any kind of a recommendation to the full commission on this topic, even even if just something small that might we maybe make progress on? I'm not sure. On the topic of racial equity, or on the topic of the non-citizen voting, the court ruling, the racial equity. Yeah, I would love to be able to propose that we prioritize a plan toward um, equity within the commission and how we operate. Um, and that will be something that will be an ongoing process that perhaps by the end of the year, we can all have buy in around. Does that sound suitable to you? Um, yeah, well, yeah, it's whatever. You're thinking, I mean, I was also thinking maybe if there's something specific that we wanted to do yeah. in the short term that might need the commission's approval. Like, um, like, I don't know if we wanted to have like a page in our website about racial equity, we could start that now. Yep. I don't know if we technically need to vote on that or, but I mean, it can't hurt. Um, yeah, and um, one thought, because we may not have a lot of content initially, um, you know, certainly on the About Us page, I think as a starting point, we could include some language around that, and we could include our demographics if everyone's comfortable with it, and about the commissioners. My only concern about having special web pages is in that, you know, tends to isolate things, and we actually want to make this as an integrated part of our operation. Um, so until we have like, like I said, enough content to kind of 
have a beefy separate page. Um, we can incorporate content, I think, in the primary, in the home page, in the about page, about us page. Uh, I think that would be a good start. I also would recommend that we incorporate our pronouns and um, and on the website, and perhaps even um, at the beginning of our meetings as a regular commission as well. Um, I think that's something that can be added as the the demographics. Um, yeah, I think we would just have to, if we're going to integrate it, think about how that data would be displayed. Sorry. So oh, sorry. I can, I can, I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh. Commissioner Dye, if you can move the, the microphone over just a little. Oh, there we go. Might be the mask. Is that better? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I'll remember to speak into the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. What are your thoughts, President? Yeah, well, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, if there are elements that we would like to include on our website now, I think it would be probably helpful if we adopt a recommendation today that we, you know, recommend to the commission that we do this, these things. And yeah, it can include any or all of the things that we're talking about today. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I think you know, um, racial identity, um, pronouns. Uh, I don't, I don't know what else, uh, you think is important. Um, special interest groups. I know yeah. perhaps we can look at what the, um, the, uh, status of women uses mission, what they look at. Yeah. Um, so. Specifically, LGBTQ mm -hmm. plus and um, uh, gender and um, racial and ethnic identity. I, I would have to go back and, and relook at it, but yeah, I would recommend we at least include pronouns, racial and ethnic identity, and gender um, or um, uh, sexual orientation. I, I don't know. Um, do you have feelings about that? I at least want to include pronouns, racial and ethnic identity and special groups. Special. Would you Committee want to do that interest. for on the individual level for the pronouns? Yes, but for the other stuff, would you want to just do a aggregate or individual level? I think so. I think that's something we should include uh, Commissioner Bernholtz in the discussion and just. Agreed. What's that? I think we should include Commissioner Bernholtz in that discussion. It's like, because again, it's it's the same question I have about the commissioner database. Yeah. It's like, there's a reason it's reported in aggregate because not everyone's comfortable Agreed. with that information. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's worth a discussion. I, I propose aggregate um, because also, especially if we're talking about sexual orientation, not wanting anyone to feel outed in any capacity. Exactly. Um, I think that's completely prudent, um, but in the meantime, perhaps if we want to just prioritize our pronouns, racial and ethnic identity, or any other specific communities of interest. So, for example, I would want to incorporate that I'm a Jewish um, individual on the commission, which often doesn't get incorporated into racial and ethnic identity. Um, and so I would want to incorporate that community um, as a part of the demogra my demographic as well. So. At this point, I think the recommendation is pronouns, racial, ethnic identity, slash an interest, special community um, group. And, and it could be self-described too. Sure. Right. Yeah. So we could have the column and then we can let every commissioner decide what they want to say. Yeah. The other um, last consideration is just um, uh, the fact that, you know, I consider myself able-bodied. Um, thinking about uh, disability and access, as I think this was something that was actually raised in our previous um, regular meeting um, and the access to voting, I think is something that's very important um, when we're thinking about um, folks who are not able-bodied. So these are all things that go into thinking about equity if we start to go down and wanting to make sure we're inclusive. Do you have any feelings about, I mean, at this point, I've, we've said pronouns, racial, ethnic identity, um, uh, um, disability status, um, gender, and well, I guess pronouns go with gender identity um, and sexual orientation. But at this point, what 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 do you all feel comfortable? I know you, Commissioner Dye, said you want to wait for 
um, Commissioner Bernholtz to be a part of the discussion to get further than pronouns and racial identity. Is that where we want to stop for now? Yeah, well, maybe for the purposes of a recommendation, we could just recommend to the commission that we include demographic information, information on our website. And then during the full commission, we could have sure. a discussion about what it should look like exactly. Yeah. And then maybe even when someone can mock up like a chart or something, you know? Yeah. Well, and I, and I think there could be just a, a, a column that you can put whatever yeah. identifying information you want, because like otherwise that. this is going to be a very big chart. <laughs> yeah, I like that <laughs> you know idea. I mean? uh -huh. so you, that's what I'm saying is that we can allow each commissioner to kind of choose how they want to identify and, and publicly. Sure. Right. You know, and then there should be plenty of information. And that's something we can point appointing authorities to mm -hmm. is to say, please look at who we have on the commission now so that they can consider the makeup and the composition of the commission when they, when they consider their appointees. Great. So it sounds like the recommendation we're going to make is to include demographics on the website and we will discuss what that will entail at the next commission meeting. And I'm happy to take on drafting some ideas of what that would include um, for everyone to review ahead of the meeting. Okay. Great. And then were you also thinking about, you had like a link to s some training stuff or would that come later? That will be on my list. So I think okay. it's, I have three key um, things that I um, have to, or that I'm responsible for. One is what we just talked about, the, um, the review of what types of demographics we could include. Do we want aggregate? Do we want um, uh, granular self-disclosed? Uh, Second is, drafting the um, the uh, list of items that we have talked about today and including some additional uh, documents that speak to those items. And then the third is, and perhaps maybe this is more of a longer medium term, is um, discussing training and things to get us all on the same page about racial equity. Does that sound correct? Am I missing anything? I don't think so. Okay. I don't. I don't think we need to make a motion, do we, to to provide that recommendation to the commission? Um, no, I don't. I don't think we need to. Okay. Um, but, Great. Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to discuss as it pertains to racial equity? Well, I. I'm actually. I'm interested in the land acknowledgement, but maybe, okay. maybe that's for, I don't know if you've learned anything more on that. But. Yes, that is also incorporated into it. Um, I have that as a priority that okay. Commissioner Bernholtz and I have um, spoken offline about. Okay. I can include that in the list as well. So I, let's go to public comment. Okay, we do have one caller who's had their hand raised for a while. Caller, you are unmuted and you will be speaking on racial equity. There you go. Great. Great. David Pilpel, hope you can hear me okay. That was a long discussion of a number of different topics. Um, my thoughts at this time, I would try to narrow the discussion with regard to commissions. Uh, to this commission only. You could certainly make recommendations about all the various city boards and commissions, but I think that's a bit beyond uh, the scope. The Commission on the Status of Women already reports on the diversity of appointments to boards and commissions. I don't know if that's the report that you were referring to. I couldn't tell from the discussion. Um, there are certainly uh, diverse appointment authorities here, um, which is somewhat unusual in the city, but not uh, entirely unusual. The uh, Ethics Commission of five members also has um, diverse appointing authorities. Uh, most uh, boards and commissions are appointed by the mayor or the mayor and the board of supervisors subject to confirmation. The various uh, uh, different appointment teams, they're all supposed to be broadly representative of the diversity um, of the city. With regard to compensation, that too varies by uh, body. Some uh, bodies are compensated, some aren't. Some 
vary by month or by meeting. Um, some of it is historical. Some of it relates to the amount of uh, time the planning commission uh, meets uh, weekly and has a considerable workload compared to other bodies. This body generally um, only meets once a month with the occasional BOPEC meeting. Um, benefits for um, specific commissioners uh, include uh, the health benefits that were named, but not all uh, boards and commissions um, are subject to those kind of benefits. I happen to think that all members of um, such bodies should be assigned a city email address and should be uh, required to use that city issued email address for all communication with regard to their public business. I think with regard to transportation that every member of a city board or commission um, should get um, free transit on Muni, uh, if not doing from the meetings, perhaps all the time. It's not a significant cost to the city and it um, furthers various policy goals. And for that matter, you should have free parking in the garage across the street if you have to uh, drive. Um, I don't know about Uber and Lyft for people that need that to get to meetings, but I'm happy to think about that. Um, I think expectations of members of this commission should be uh, put in writing in terms of time, in terms of uh, checking no, in with uh, various. Mr. Popel, sorry. Sorry, was that a 30 second warning? That was 10 seconds. We're at two now. Okay. Sorry about I, that. I, I can share more when you have time. I have some thoughts on this matter. Thanks for listening. Anyone else? I don't see any other callers raising their hands. Okay, great. Um, I just also can, would encourage um, members of the public and um, Mr. Pilpel, you can also submit your thoughts to us um, in writing and we welcome that. With that, let's move to agenda item number six, post-election reports to the commission, discussion and possible action regarding election reports to the, the director submits for commission review. Um, President Jardonic, do you wanna kick this off? Sure, so this, this item um, was fairly simple. Um, so in the past, um, after each election, Director Ernst has given the commission a few different reports. So there's the, um, the incident report, the provisional ballot report, the vote by mail report, and then the conditional voter registration report. Is that correct, Director Ernst? I know years and years ago, he um, also provided like redacted emails from the public that covered, you know, issues that people had, um, which we stopped doing that several years ago. But um, but there are also other numbers that I think we might be interested in, and this was listed out in a, a document I, I attached a meeting or two ago. So I was thinking if maybe we could um, um, basically kind of write down for future commissioners, what are the things we would like to see after each election? And it could, um, you know, include the things that Director Arntz is already providing, but then also, you know, maybe additional numbers that we'd like to see after each election so that we don't need to, you know, ask for them each time or, um, so I wanted to just talk about that and um, to see if, you know, maybe there are additional things that people were interested in. So you can also just talk to Director Arntz with the effort that goes into, you know, getting those numbers after each election. So, so I guess maybe to start off the um, discussion, but I'll, I'll let any either of you chime in. But um, the um, the numbers that I personally would be interested in are are listed in the document, the two documents that I provided, and then. Um, Maybe Director Arntz, one question I would have for you is, like, how much work is it to, yeah. to get those numbers that I asked for before? The total will be provided after the, the June election. Uh, after the election, we we can do it. It's hard to do it like during the cycle, during the, the the tabulation. But this is all; these are all numbers that we we capture anyway, so we can provide the provide the information. Okay.
I um I actually was also going to ask a similar uh, a similar question, and if there's a specific area that is particularly more um, of a heavy lift than others, and whether that's actually, you know, if there's an area that is particularly time consuming, labor intensive to extract, us discussing if that's what we believe is the most important is or is important to include. Um, as it pertains to um, the uh, the reports and other things that I'd be interested in, I think just trends um, trends over um, different ele election cycles is something that I find interesting that could also be helpful perspective. Um, if it isn't a heavy lift, I think trending is is an interesting thing to look at. For example, we were talking about mail-in voting um, and how that has gone, you know, skyrocketed, obviously. Um, I think that would be interesting just as like some color to the reports. Um, and then I also would love to incorporate the numbers around how voters cast their ballot. If we can incorporate that into each election, I think, that would be awesome um, because that does help with trending as well and us being able to compare. That was just me. So, um, so actually, if if it's just if it's not that difficult to produce the uh, numbers that Commissioner Giordani could ask for, you know, we don't need it. Well, you know, the sausage is being made, but at the end, yes, would love to see it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, in terms of the trends, uh, I think we'll get into this in, in item seven. Uh, what I think um, uh, President Shapiro is talking about is providing context, and that's something I think the public needs as well. So, so we know from trends, right? Uh, what is typical for you know a primary election, a presidential election? We know we know that you know. Um, participation goes up and, you know, again, we know what's typical. So um, providing that kind of context, I, I think is extraordinarily helpful so that people can say, oh, this election is, you know, more exciting than usual, or it's pretty much on par with what we get because we generally have high participation rates in San Francisco. So I think uh, that's also where we run into issues with the media right because they start extrapolating things and they're using preliminary results instead of final results and you know they're being lazy about you know finding the right report for rcv but i would actually like to make it so easy that it's not doesn't require five clicks to get something that that you know they're able to say oh okay this is typical this is what our normal you know participation rate is and we can see we're right on track for that right that's what i meant by at a glance Kind of stuff and you know for example the vote by mail thing i doubt this is going to change i mean the last three elections have been well over 90 percent right vote by mail so so i think we can make that statement now typically you know 90 percent of the votes cast are, are using vote by mail ballots and just provide that information you know i know that for a specific election it might be 95% or it might be 91% or whatever, but we know it's pretty much going to be over 90% at this point. So let's just give the public that information. So I didn't mean to bleed into item seven, but I think it's relevant. <laughs> so, so it's not just for us, in other words. I think that everybody, at the end of the day, they just want to know who's winning. You know, is this typical? Um, and, you know, do I need to adjust my expectations based on that? So... Yeah, yeah, and I that's fine. We can we can do all that. The the trends, a lot of the trends would be after the election that we would, would provide, and and also like the timing you guys would want those trends. Yeah, if you wanted like like in November, for instance, that would be really challenging, challenging for us. But as far as the website is concerned, as we try to convey the information that I sent, uh, we can like the X of Y, for instance, the precincts reporting. We can put information around there. And we actually did a canvas of all the websites in the state for all the elections offices to see how they present the results and then try to get some ideas there. And then like half do their own websites, half have a vendor. 
we met with a vendor yesterday trying to see if, if there was any value for us to actually move to someone who that develops websites so we could we could uh, avail ourselves of, of more widgets and, and things like that that we yeah. haven't developed yet. But right now, uh, we, we can't do it for November. It's, just, it's too soon for us to, to, to create a new website. Um, then also with the ranked choice, the way the ranked choice is now, we we, we have to use the CAN reports from the system. We, we, we can't add to those. Uh, so we, we can put explanations around the, the information before people get to those detailed reports. And I mean, there's, there's, you can even have like a, like an in-between page where you, you click on this, on the summary numbers on the, on the, on the, on the first report, go to the in-between page with an explanation or, or, you know what I mean? So there's, there's ways to get inf more, more information out there. We're, we're totally looking at it. And then uh, we put some ideas for just to give you a sense. Really? Actually, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Let's so this this is actually what this what you're talking about is is the next agenda item, and um, this this agenda item was just meant to be about the reports that um, oh, that we get. Yeah. And if it's just as easy for you to, to generate them, you know, after the election, oh, yeah. we don't need interim ones. Let's just say let's do it. Yeah. So yeah, we we can provide the the the, the information we provided, and then um, you know, as far as trends are concerned, we we can you know, if you guys have certain trends or you're looking at you know we can consider what we can do there because we may not think yeah. what you're interested in you know so my suggestion on trends was actually that we know what the big trends are and to actually reflect that in in the public reporting so that we don't that the commission doesn't need a special report on trends because we actually oh sharing with the public about what is typical, right? So, um, just to go back to talking about the reports to the commission, and I, I think there is some obvious blending between mm -hmm. these, and I, it's possible even that Director Ernst, you know, even talking about this element of someone who can, you know, looking at new vendors with, you know, um, a new dashboard or whatever it may be also influences how you would report to us. Mm -hmm. um, so, I can see that overlap. As it pertains to trends, um, I definitely can put together some thoughts that I'm particularly interested in, um, like just off the top of my head, um, turnout and incident reporting and um, uh, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll put some thoughts into it, but it doesn't necessarily need to be um, a really extensive thing. My My thought is it would be helpful when talking about like certain things that occurred in the like when you're um, drafting the report that the context of this has changed over the last few elections or this is similar to previous just like some qualifier so that um there's some the context around it and then i think we can talk about the public like how we are disclosing that to the public um when we're talking about the election results that we share with with them um does that make sense to everyone yeah and, and i'm just trying to help director arms here would it be okay if this is just a, a qualitative thing like for example it was very helpful in the last report where you said you know this election we were really hit hard by covid and that was reflected in the number of poll workers that you know didn't show up and you know there was a lot of incidents as a result right so that's that was very helpful context so what I'm just um, trying to interpret what you're saying there. So just providing that level of context again. Not just numbers. Yeah, like yeah. turnout was, you know, really above average for this kind of primary election, or this was a special election. So generally turnout is lower and that's what we got, or, you know, it was significantly higher than we would have typically expected. Just to provide that little bit of context when you do the election reporting. So I think it's probably fine to just add just a little a little more color mm -hmm. yeah i mean i would i would actually in terms of trends and i i don't want to ask anything more maybe today but um i would actually be interested in seeing not just a qualitative but like this is what you know the percent of ballots that were dropped off in the dropbox for the past four elections and oh look people started using dropboxes more it's going up or something, you know, for a lot of these percentages. But um, but I also want to be 
you know, I don't want to demand more than we really need because, you know, for each number that we want to see a trend for it, it adds to the work. But um, maybe when we, we have a couple elections, we could, you know, pick out the things we want to see tr trends for, you know, it could be a percentage that c comes over time. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're going to be generating these numbers anyway, it might be as simple as just, you know, we start the next election and then we just track it. Yeah. So we, we have the last N number of elections and we can just like look at the last five elections and, and just keep tracking it as we go and just increment. <clears throat> Sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you. Please finish. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. So, I mean, if you're going to report to us anyway, then it's just a matter of tagging on the next one and then we'll see trends. So whatever's easiest for you, I, just so that we can we can see because we we kind of know and I know you know in your head and you know um, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, communicating this to the public, uh, which will be our next item, which I'm anxious <laughs> to get to, um, because then people can can understand and they don't misinterpret like all the stuff that I put in my memo. You know, reporters reporting incorrectly, and that, my God, they've been reporting incorrectly as long as we've had ranked choice voting. It's like let's let's just dumb it down and make it so easy that anyone can just look at this and like ah, you know, I understand. So, so can we move on to the next slide? Yes. Well, but I, was there something else you wanted to? Yeah. Um, add? I well, in the previous slide we talked about non-citizen voting and. That's actually, now that I'm reminded of it, that would be another number I'd be interested in. But do you know offhand approximately how many non-citizens voted in the, were they allowed to vote in the recall or? No. No, they voted in February. I'm sorry, yeah, February, that's what I was yeah, talking they, they about. Yeah, they voted in February. I think, I think there's 100 or so, 135. Okay. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So, I mean, for the purposes of this item, I mean, I, I was thinking what what we could do is, or I mean, I, I could do is basically make a, a one page document saying these are the things we'd like to see after each election. And then it would just be essentially what's listed here plus what he's already providing. And then, you know, we can also say trends for all or most of these. Yeah, I, I also would be interested in us if we're gonna add new tasks or like new asks on the report Perhaps we can also propose areas that they that the director and his the department doesn't have to necessarily include in every election report because you know it's already quite lengthy. Are there areas that you feel that we I mean I, I don't know off the top of my hand. I'm just thinking that, you know, are there areas that we can streamline a bit so that it's more tailored to the things that we as a commission are specifically focused on. Um, I'm happy to share my thoughts in writing, um, but curious to hear what you both think about that. Um, well, what specifically? That's what I have to evaluate. I think my, my general position was if we're gonna ask for additional reporting, then are there ways that we can balance out by streamlining other areas? So as to not create another work. And also, I just wanted to add about the trending. Um, the uh, director Ernst, my my um, proposal around that was um, not at all expecting that that would come necessarily immediately uh, in the in you know over the course of a few weeks. So if you say there's no way that by the November um, commission meeting, we can be able to provide a full analysis of the training. I think that's, that's fair. So, so long as, you know, in the, in the next commission meeting, we can review what those trends are. I just wanted to share that separately. Um, but I'm happy to propose, if you are open to putting a list of the trends that you want to include, I could propose, um, a couple of items unless, unless the two of you don't feel that there's anything that should be streamlined but um i imagine it takes a while to put this together well i think i guess currently there are only the only reports he's providing are there's the incident report the vote by mail report the conditional voter registration and provision and i think those are like out of the box reports right they just those are write them right director Ernst, 
Are they fairly easy to generate? Yeah, the, it's a report. We, we have to uh, format it for PDF, but the other reports, we have to just input the number into a table, but yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Would you mind repeating? The, 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 the numbers for the ballots, we have to just input those numbers into a table. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I guess I was thinking more about the director's report generally. Oh, I see. Um, because often that incorporates insights about the elections that were conducted. I mean, there have been a lot of elections over the last year. I think we can all agree. So um, perhaps that will that will change. But I was I think I was thinking separately about the director's report and not just about the um, post election. Reports. Okay, I see. Um, okay, are there? So it sounds like the takeaway is, President Jordanic, you're going to provide a list of suggestions for what you would want to include trending on. Is that accurate? Well, it would be a list of the percentages or a list of what to include after each election and then plus, you know, which of the things we'd like to see trends on. Mm -hmm. And I, I say which of the things because maybe I don't think we need to know like the percentage of single card ballots remade versus like the overall number or yeah. something. But um, Okay. Um, I don't think that we need to make a motion on any of that. So can we just move straight to public comment? Sure. We do have Mr. Pelpel who's had his hand raised. And Mr. Pelpel, you are commenting on post election reports to the commission. Great. Thank you. And if I could get a 30 second warning, that would be fantastic. Um, so as I think I've um, suggested uh, before, um, while the commission reviews the election plan before uh, the election and has a post election analysis of whether each election was uh, whatever the three F's are fair, fun, and fantastic. Um, <laughs> I would like to see in the, the future, and maybe this is where we're moving, is a cover memo um, with the post election uh, report with all of the various uh, IRIS and BBM and CVR reports as attachments. Uh, that would be a, a fairly short cover memo, in my view, uh, with those attachments to bookend the election plan uh, review um, and say during this election, here were the significant things that happened, um, some information about, you know, good, bad, and otherwise um, that would aid the commission in making its finding of the three Fs. Um, and if there's corrective action uh, needed or something that suggested that that, you know, might come up like the, you know, we were heavily impacted by COVID, things like that. Um, if at some point you're considering proposing a charter amendment, you might want to include that as part of the um, updated language on the election plan. That's not just the, um, the analysis afterwards, but that there's some uh, slight amount of, of detail uh, required of the department um, to uh, aid the commission in making that finding. Um, I would be careful to include as much straight information, uh, but limit the amount of analysis. Um, and I would just be careful when you talk about trends, because I think those are the kinds of things that um, political consultants and data analysts uh, like to uh, work on. And I'm not sure that having the department do that kind of numerical trend analysis um, is a good direction to spend public money on. But the kind of um, qualitative discussion of these were the kinds of successes that we saw or the kinds of problems that were in, encountered um, might suggest a, a certain uh, a direction for um, the kind of trend analysis. But I'm interested in what commissioners bring back to a future meeting in terms of things. That's your 30 that second mark. Thank you. Um, in terms of things that are important to members of the commission could be included in those reports. Uh, those are my thoughts at this time. I agree that no action is uh, needed right now, but this will come back either to BOPEC or to a commission meeting in the future. Thanks for listening. Okay, I don't see any other callers raising their hands. Okay, President Jordan. Yeah, can I, Director Ernst, can I just ask before I make this document for the next meeting, or is, or is there anything that you want to just, just say maybe? Um, 
you know, before I create it, like certain, just any limitations or anything or in terms of what, what is asked for? You know, I mean, I think what forward your suggestions will go from there because I, I don't want to, uh, I'm not going to limit you now. I, I'm sorry? I, I don't want to limit you now in, in your, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So put forward your suggestions, we'll go from there. So Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so with that, let's move to uh, agenda item seven, public election results reporting. And we're very antsy to discuss this <laughs> discussion and possible action regarding public election results reporting, including information shared on the Department of Elections website. Um, and I just want to quickly um, say thank you specifically to President Jordanic for putting together a very robust um, historical context for um, for us because that was selfishly very helpful for me. Yeah, me as well. I, I thought it was helpful. Like I um, wasn't aware that there was an open source reporting project. I actually really love those results. So uh, that I just thought they were so clear at a glance, which is really what we're we're hoping for. So my first my first question to Director Arntz is, why aren't we using those? Because the system doesn't generate the data in a way that I think, and I, Commissioner Jankoff to speak on this, in a way that that his reporting uh, program can use it. So it, I, I read something that the software had been updated, and there, and then the, after that, they it's it doesn't produce the it can't feed this re re results reporter anymore. Is that? Would you mind if we let, I don't know if there was something you wanted to frame the conversation around. I apologize. I think I, I not to uh, diminish your questions. I just want to make sure because um, President Jordanic had put together this report. Is there anything that you wanted to say up front? Um, no, I'm, I'm fine with the way the discussion is okay. fine. We can Great. try dig in where people okay. want to dig in. Apologies. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, so yeah, I read in in your memo that the software had been updated, um, and after that, it wasn't producing stuff in HTML anymore. Yeah. So, well, so Commissioner, Dye, I think the the point you're focusing on now is there was one particular ranked choice voting report that it's the round by round grid, which um, before 2019, and correct me if I'm wrong, Director Ernst, the the previous Dominion system generated those in, as an HTML page. And then the, the newer system that we acquired in 2019, it only generated a PDF, right? That's my understanding. Yeah. So that's limited to just that one page. Okay. But my, my question really was um, the results reporter, the open source results reporter, Creates exactly the kind of very clear at a glance. I can tell who won. You know, uh, uses color to help me understand uh, whether something lost or something won. Um, is there a reason we can't use that? That that was what my question was. Because the because the previous voting system issued the results in an HTML format, mm -hmm. which is the format that Commissioner Jordanic's program uses. So it would suck up that information and. And right. Present these. And the current system issues the data, the great choice voting in the PDF format. Okay. And so that, somebody would have to do some data entry to, to basically. Well, the data is coming after the algorithm runs the numbers. So, it's, uh, I mean, potentially, yeah, that there could be someone doing all the data entry. But since we run like on election night, we run the rank choice three times. Yeah. And then every day after that, it would it would take a lot. It's painful. Yes. Well, can I can I make a um, just a comment on that point? I think the Dominion system today it doesn't issue the HTML reports for the ranked choice voting, but it does generate the XML. So it's it's probably very likely that the same numbers can be extracted from the XML files. But also, I, I also want to make the point that the the question about the results reporter is in general. Um, I mean, this question is only about the round by round totals, but the other parts about like the winners and things like that. Yeah. That's that's separate from the question of the the round by round totals. Yes. 
Yes, I'm talking in general about, you know, this is the same way they report on TV, right? When we're looking at results and they'll say, check, okay, this one's winning, right? Uh, you know, and this one required two thirds. So even though it's like 62%, I don't have to look up that it needed two thirds. I can see that it's red and I know that it's not winning, right? So they're just, this is the kind of at a glance, make it so simple anyone can understand it, you know, at a glance without having to understand the threshold or, you know, look something up and figure out what round it's in. You know, there's just a lot of um, clicking and having to understand election processes to understand where we're at. And all a member of the public wants to know is, you know, who's winning, <laughs> you know, and where are we now? So I know uh, how much longer I have to wait till I know who, who won. I mean, that's really what I as a member of the public want to know. And, you know, even before I got on this commission and I would go to the results reporting page, I noticed I had to do a lot of interpreting to figure it out. For the ranked choice. Not just ranked choice. For elections that have more than one winner, for example, that, you know, it's four, four people win this election, right? So, like, figuring out who's winning, I don't know, because all I got were percentages and a list of names, right? So, what I liked about the, the open source reportings, it's, it's very clear. It's, it's like I can tell because in the election where there are four winners, I can see the top four are in green, and I know that everything below that is losing, right? That's like all instantly I can understand what's happening. Like I don't have to know or look up somewhere else that there are four winners for this election. And so I think that's the challenge that we have is that there's a ton of data on the reporting site, but you have to understand election processes to understand how to interpret the results right now. And I think, you know, there are a couple of key pieces of information that I would want to know as a voter. One is I'd love to have a countdown, you know, to election day and then hear like the countdown for the seven days that, you know, your ballot has to be received by the department, right? So that it's very clear when it's over, <laughs> right? And then, um, and I think that's probably pretty easy. Uh, you know, you don't need a lot of programming to put a countdown, you know, for that. Um, and then the other piece is, you know, what's left to count. So you report what's counted, what's counted, and here's what we know is left to count, and plus unknown ballots that are coming into the mail to us. But here's what we know. And I know that I've seen that information in your press releases, but I don't want to have to go click to the press releases page to read about it. I just want to have it right there on the on the results reporting page. So I know that you guys have the information. It's just a matter of communicating it. And so I guess my question is, I appreciate that you, you put this together and have, you know, uh, made some proposals here, but my immediate reaction was um, who wrote the copy for the explanatory text that you're proposing? On our website? Yeah, I don't need to know the direct person in particular, but is there, um, a function that that writes the explanatory text on that page. No, it, it's all text that we produce. Okay. I'm just wondering, you know, remember you told me you had a, a great employee who comes up with the little taglines for for each election? I want that person writing the copy. <laughs> you know, right now reads like a like technical documentation. Like at the end of it, I'm just I have no idea what I'm reading anymore. It is like just really long and you know it doesn't give me the information i need in the kind of a succinct way and so are you just so i'm following are you referring to the planned updates to the department yes page? the okay. planned update to the department so i appreciate that we're, we are going to have some explanatory text but can we get it in like one sentence or two sentences or uh, an explain you know an adjective you know in in how it's reported instead of a you know, here are three paragraphs and you have to click and go to our press, you know, releases to read this, or you have to go to our digital report to get that. It's like, I don't want to have to do that because I'm lazy. I'm a reporter and I'm lazy. I'm a member of the public and I'm lazy. I just want to know what the result is, you know, where we are. And so 
So I know you have the information because I've seen it, but I've had to click like five or six, seven times to get to it and providing, you know, three paragraphs explaining all the clicks you're going to have to do to get to it. You know, it doesn't actually address the, the challenge that we have, which is to answer the fundamental questions the public wants to know, which is. How's my candidate doing and how much more do you have to count before I can figure out whether I should celebrate or not? <laughs> right? I mean, that's at the end of the day, what people really want. So, um, so I think, you know, what I really loved about the, uh, open source results reporters is just. So clear, it's graphical, you know, it uses color, you know, it incorporates already whether it, it won or not. Like, I don't have to know, is it a 50 plus one vote? Is it a two thirds vote? Is it, you know, does this one only have one winner or are there four winners for this? Like, I don't have to know anything. I just know, you know, very binary. Is it winning or is it not winning? <laughs> so that's the kind of, you know, kind of communication that, that that I'm hoping for. I'm wondering if perhaps thinking about this in short and long term. Um, so, you know, I, I think that I, I guess I, I see your commissioner. I see your point about like the technical language. Though I also can understand, you know, as someone who is a very <laughs> um, obsessive about language. I think that it's also really important to be to not soften language that is like really technical, though I do agree that perhaps there are edits and I'm willing to also participate in what those pro proposed edits could be to the ex explanatory text. But if it's a huge overhaul for redoing the results page, Perhaps that's a longer term conversation around whether it's the the vendor um, that they spoke with or talking about using the open source reports um, software. Um, it seems like short and long term, just because we do have the November election coming up. I just don't know. I, I guess that's where my head is at as I was thinking while you were while you were talking. Um, but short and long term, like next year, and perhaps it's even also, you know, including it in the budget for next year is uh, financing a vendor who can provide the type of reporting that we think is closer to what we think is helpful for the public. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I love all of the ideas, but I'm also conscious of how much effort it would take to get there. And so I'm wondering if there's a, a short term fix. Um, yeah. So I think the short term fix is to, you know, use explanatory language. I'm just suggesting making it more succinct and maybe providing context back again to, you know, providing the information that 90% of our, our you know, voters use vote by mail now. I mean, I think after three elections, we can very confidently say that and not feel like we're going to be that far off. So rather than, um, for example, uh, the explanatory text just to say that it's expected to increase and we're going to post preliminary results, it's like just give them the information. Just say, usually it's about 90%. You know, we've counted, you know, and usually the turnout is X for this kind of election. And here's where we are based on, you know, we've collected this many ballots and we've processed half of them. You know, and that's much shorter than, you know, this kind of very general language and saying, go to our website. I mean, go to our press releases for these other reports. It's like, can we just say it right there? And just, you know, not force people to click around because. As you know, people don't have patience for that. I mean, what is the average time on a website now? Like 7 seconds or something, <laughs> you know, so if they don't get it in 7 seconds, they've already moved on. And what's, what's been a problem, particularly with the RCV is that. You know, they find the 1st number they see. I know that you put 1st round totals there, but. Whoosh, 
right? They're like, it's on the summary page, so it must be, it must be the number. And then they've often, they've submitted their story already. You know, they don't have time to click to the detailed results and then find which of the seven reports on that page is the right one. You know, they're just not gonna do it. And so how can we just give them the information they want right up front? You know, and I know it's like maybe a little manual hack um, to write a little bit of text, but it's probably gonna be true for a while that, you know, our vote by mail is gonna be over 90% and, the turnout is going to be typically X for these kinds of elections, and it's probably going to hold for a long time. So I, I feel like we can, you know, have a reasonable amount of confidence or, or even want to say the average of the last three elections were X. Just so that we're just very much just the facts, ma'am, right? Are you thinking that that would be like when that would be? So, for example, the. Um... Actually, let me ask the question first. Are you thinking that would be on election day or ahead of election day? Because one thing I'm thinking about is being wary of suggesting the projected turnout because that can actually influence not people saying, voting. Not projecting, just saying this is what has been typical and then reporting what it is. And then let people interpret themselves. They could say, oh, okay, so typically this election is, you know, this kind of election has a 40% turnout. And I can see right now it's only at 20. And I see over here that there are all these unprocessed ballots. So I can see that I shouldn't be drawing any conclusions yet because yeah. there are a lot of ballots that haven't been counted yet. Yeah, it's only, so I guess maybe the way I'm thinking about it is rather than saying usually it's this or that, but rather, um, X amount of ballots have uh, total have been um, have been counted of the total submitted at that point, um, and then yeah. perhaps including having a running total uh, updated as of um, and a date, the date or in time of when it was last updated. Yeah. So I, I, I'm sure you guys could come up with it because I know you have the date. I've seen it. It's just that it, like I said, my objection is the fact that it takes. A lot of reading and 10 clicks to get to it that that's that's it it's like instead of providing the explanation of the five pages i have to go to to find this just give them the information you know because it is supposed to be a summary page right and then my other comment was the the open source results reporting so it sounds like commissioner dronotic it might actually be possible to use it it's what i'm hearing if it's if it if it exports in XML, you can suck it in. Because I think those, I mean, I'm just so impressed. That's exactly what I was looking for. It's like, I want to see the winners and I don't want to have to know any details about the election. I just want to know what's winning, whatever the appropriate winning standard is. I want that incorporated in the answer. So I don't have to like research it and realize, oh, I thought this was winning, but now I realize this was a two thirds vote thing. So it actually is losing, right? <laughs> I just want it to be green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so it, it, I'm just saying, if there's an easy way just to use it, it looks like it produces fabulous results already. Um, so I don't know if that's just a technical consultation here. And otherwise, I think that's the kind of result that I'm talking about that just makes it easy for someone to understand what's going on. Well, good feedback, thank you. So, yeah, I want to just kind of add a little bit to the conversation. Um, so, I, I agree, Director Ernst, that there's a limit to what what you can do before November. And so, I, I, I agree that there's probably a short-term solution and longer-term solution. And in terms of in terms of what um, the director provided today, and he in his email, this is before he had a chance to read the long memo that I had included but um i mean my my concern with that proposal is that we don't and i'm kind of going along with what commissioner dice said i mean adding more text could just make it even more confusing because you know like she said you know people don't necessarily read things and it'll just be more that they have to scroll past and rather than providing instructions on how to find what people might be interested, we could see what we can do to make it easier for them to go there naturally without having to provide 
instructions. But um, so, I mean, I would like to see a longer term plan to to actually get the things we really want instead of uh, like a short term kind of way to kind of patch patch what we have. But um, and then I I think yeah we can take time for that because you know you you, you even had, haven't even had a chance to look over what was before us today. But um, in terms of the short term, I would like to talk a little bit more today about you know what what could be done before November, and I realize we could have more conversations about it. But for example, I mean let's just assume that you can't you can't do anything of the processing of the XML before November. And we all know that the thing that has been confusing for at least, I, I guess it's been five years now, that the, even reporters are looking at the numbers for the first choice and they think that that's the final numbers. So maybe we just, um, you know, leave off the first choice numbers and then just provide a link to the PDF file that the Dominion provides, and then that way, you know, they go scroll down to the RCV contest, they see the link, they click on that, and then they see the results. And there's no, and that's kind of the best we can do in the short term, because we, we don't have the time to, to extract out the numbers from the, the export files. But that would be like, I think, an improvement over today. And, um, and then they, people wouldn't have to read instructions on how to find, they could just yeah. They see the link and they click on it or. I, I think um, Commissioner John is making an excellent point, which is this is a situation where less is more. And there's so much data and so many reports. And then the report that's called summary isn't a summary, you know, and the reports that that is called final isn't final. So it's like too much data. It's in it's misleading. The titles are misleading. Um, and so it really takes an expert or someone who's willing to read instructions on how to read instructions to actually get the number you want. So much so that all of our major newspapers are reporting the numbers incorrectly, which I fault them for as well, because journalism isn't what it used to be. <laughs> but the thing is we could really make it easier for them knowing that that is the environment we're in now. It's like people have the attention of a gnat and they just, they just want what they want and they want to be able to click it and get straight to it. And there are nerds like us who will want to look at those other detailed reports and you still have a place for those. So you can let the nerds go do, they can just, you know, have a party and read every other report, but the average member of the public and apparently the average member of the media right now, they just want to know who's winning. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I just want to uh, jump in. I think I think that point is made very clear, and so I just I'm I'd like it just in the interest of time to move toward what solutions. Um, so it sounds like um, the language maybe would change, or the first count not included with a link to the Dominion PDF. Was there anything else you wanted to propose before November? And then the longer term, talking about a more robust. Um, strategy of how to incorporate rep public reporting in, a, in the format that we really want, the toward, closer to the vision of what we would want. Yeah, well, I guess I guess I would like to see if if Director Arns can, um, you know, if you could look at the the memo from today and then come back to us and see is there anything more that you think you could do in the short term, and then um, and yeah and separately have a longer term plan. I think the one thing I may, might like to spend a little bit more time talking about today is the the, the whole issue of the progress of ballots counted so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's something we could talk a little bit about. Do but, you mean progress in terms of how many votes have been counted? Yeah, and and here here there's an issue because if you only look at how many ballots the department has received so far, and the, the thing is, it could be like 30% of the ballots are, exactly. are at the post office. And you're not gonna know that until, until the day you... after election. Yeah. So on on page 15 of at the top yeah. of my memo, yep. I had a suggestion that mm -hmm. it's not like projected or, or something. It's like, 
based on an average of the last, this is what the percent would be or something. I so like people see that, oh, this is only 50% of the ballots. Th that's like a really important number. Yeah, you know? I think that was a good suggestion. And also, um, thanks for bringing that back up. Also, the date or number of days uh, provided so members of the public can know how long they need to wait before most are processed. I think that's a good addition. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, that was the only other thing I was going to add, but I think that's a great um, addition. And it, it doesn't have to be paragraphs. It could be like no. a sentence or two, but it could be like a link to. Yeah, you know. I'd actually strongly suggest that it not be paragraphs <laughs> and that it just be a, you know, descriptive adjective and a, a couple of key sentences and then a link directly to what they're looking for. Um, uh, the other thing I would suggest, in addition to testing it on us, because we are all voters too, uh, is to test it on, you know, in, in tech, we call it the mom test. Test it on your mom, right? If your mom understands it, then it's a good chance that everybody else will understand it. So just do a little testing. I mean, you know, get, get some non elections workers to just, you know, try the, try the new, new, um, descriptor paragraph, hopefully descriptor sentences and say, does this make it clearer? You know, and just get some suggestions, just get a little feedback. One thing I'm just thinking about in the context of what um, Commissioner Dye and President Jordan have been saying is, you know, perhaps also, you know, in addition to these suggestions, we could consider drafting something ahead of the November of election, November elections that we share with the media. That is, here is how this process works. This is how people tend to be voting now. There was a lot of misunderstanding in the press uh, in the J June election. And so ahead of November, we want to set the right expectations. Um, that could be something that we also consider doing in addition to making these tweaks. What are your thoughts? Poor Director Arntz has been trying to explain this to the media for years now. And I, I really think that if we put the focus on simplifying the results reporting, that it wouldn't be necessary for that. I'm not saying that we might not consider it anyway, and you're, you you have to go on the explanation tour during the election. It seems like all the time anyway, but I do think it's it's a bit of a self inflicted wound because we just we just provide so much data that people can't and they can't interpret it properly themselves. So we need to do it for them and just spoon feed them what they need to know. And then I think it will reduce the time that you have to spend with the media explaining why you know, explaining how RCV works and, and it should be really simple. It's like, you really just want to see it at the end <laughs> and you can show the progress, but, you know, continuing to show on the, on the first results page, the first choice totals, it's not helpful, you know, and it makes people think that a minority candidate is getting in, which is exactly the opposite of what RCV is supposed to do. And so that's that's damaging, right? That reduces public faith in the process, which is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Well, so if you're if you. Commissioner Dye, if you're not um, as supportive of that, I'm also happy to draft it myself. Um, I. I think we could have a bigger conversation about this perhaps in September uh, in advance of the um, November election, but perhaps with the pre-election plan. Um, once we review that, we can have a discussion as a commission. Um, so I would, I'm recommending to the full commission that we have that as a discussion. Um, potentially, yeah, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just suggesting that Director Arns go back to with his team and then you know give him a chance to absorb. The 22 page memo <laughs> and look at some of the, the nice demo results from the results reporting and see what you can do. I also just think that, like, we can also do more to support to, you know, not just share the things that. That could be presented differently, but also do our part to to represent the, the department. In the way that we're capable of, and I, I actually think that. Uh, President Jordanic's inclusion of how that has been done in the past was super enlightening for me in how we can be, um, how we can play a role in in this in addition to the department in its results. Um, Chair Shapiro, can I just 
clarify, are, are, are you suggesting that it could be like an op-ed that's before the election, like kind of like that, or were you thinking more of a press release that gets issued or? I'm open. Okay. Um, because yeah, I mean, I could, I could see us doing, you know, an op-ed or, you know, before the election saying, we're gonna have an election in a few weeks and the number you see on election nights is not going to be the whole story. You know, we could say something like that instead of after the election. Yeah. But um, I think it would be. I think it's a good precursor, knowing what a mess the national media response was to the June election, and there is so much on the ballot in November that it could be yeah. really destructive. Yeah, but but if if a short term fix could be done, then it might we might not even need it so much. But, yeah, that um, was all I was saying. Yeah, but if we, if we can I just come up with better that. language, then yeah, we, <clears throat> okay. we, we, we can, can we discuss can. it. We can revisit it. Okay. So, is there anything else, President Jordanic, that you um, wanted to discuss? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then let's move to public comment. Yes, we do have one caller. Oh, but Mr. Stephen Hill was first. <laughs> I will unmute you. You are commenting on public election results reporting. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Great. Um, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, I saw this agenda item and um, I was glad to, to see it. Um, this has been an ongoing issue for quite a few years. And, you know, as Director Arntz knows, we've always been working within the limitations of what the vendor's equipment allows. And so I think based on that, you know, they've done uh, tried to do the best they possibly can. But at this point, it's creating so much confusion. And I think there are ways to to clean this up. I think many of the comments that you commissioners are making uh, are right on. Um, in particular, when you go to um, and I'm on the page right now, when you go to the detailed reports page, there's uh, for 2020 elections, I counted 26 reports that are there. And it's just really difficult. And, and for each race, there's two RCV reports and one is detailed report. The other is short report. And probably most people think would, would think, oh, I'd like the detailed report. Well, that's actually doesn't tell you what you need to know. It's the short report. So I think on this in the short term, what Commissioner Jordanic proposed actually um, would be good is on the summary page. Um, just don't give any RC, any election results that just show first rankings because it's just creating so much confusion. Um, just have something there that says click here. And then when, when you click there, it shouldn't take you to that detailed report page because there's 25 reports on there. It should take you to the short RCV report for that specific race and only that short RCV report because that's the only one that shows the full tallied RCV results. So you can make it really simple, really clear by just having nowhere should uh, a the plurality or first choice uh, results be posted because those aren't full results though those are only partial results the, in place of that should be a link to the short uh, to the short report for each race and then on secondly um in terms of a short term solution for you know how many absentee ballots are are, are left it used to be, I, I may, Director Arnes could correct me if I'm wrong, I, I used to find that on, in press releases, but I don't even see links on here for press releases anymore. And so lately I've been finding that on the Twitter feed for the Department of Elections. So you could put at the top of the summary page, perhaps a link to that tweet, that specific tweet that has the number of ballots still left to be counted and have a spot right there under registered voters, wherever you can squeeze it in, that says for the number of ballots remaining, click here. And it takes you to that specific tweet that has the information about how many um, uh, ballots are left to be counted. That would be another short term fix potentially for that one. The Mr. Hill, you have 10 seconds. Okay, if you could give me a, a 30 second indulgence, I'd appreciate it. Um, the, the other thing I just want to throw out there for as long as we're talking about results reporting, uh, you know, in, in we've always reported registered voters and um, in terms of turnout. We've reached the three minute mark. I apologize. Can you give me another minute? Hello, are you? Yeah, are you both comfortable providing 1 yeah. extra minute? Yes. Thanks so much. Um, you know, I saw as, as to put on the list of down the road to figure out. 
in addition to posting registered voters, I think there should be a voter turnout that's based on voter age, uh, uh, VAP as they call voter age population. And um, because, you know, it really is the more accurate result of how many voters actually turned out in that election. By using just registered voter turnout, which we do in the United States, but virtually no other democracy in the world does this, you're actually inflating the voter turnout by about 25%. And exactly. so, so instead of a, a voter turnout here of 86% um, in 2020, it was really more like around, you know, a high seven, a low 70s or so, thereabouts. So it's another thing to put on your list to think of, of how to incorporate voter age population turnout along with registered voter turnout. Thank you. Next caller is Mr. Phil Pell. I will unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And once again, if I could get a 30 second warning, if I get that far. Um, so just very briefly, I appreciate the uh, commission's uh, input on this and I don't disagree with uh, Stephen Hill on this one. Um, I also wanted to point you to the staff proposed changes to the web page that uh, got posted today um, as a fourth attachment um, on this item. Uh, two pages, it looks like uh, Assistant uh, Director uh, Natalia uh, put some of this together. This really does everything that I think one can do um, without having to go back to the Secretary of State for recertification. It includes uh, a text box with an introductory uh, paragraph below the language button, and in that um, text box, it includes a link or proposes a link to the latest news uh, section or the newsroom, which presumably would either be a direct link to that day's um, uh, press release or to the list of press releases and, you know, be fairly specific. Um, there's some other stuff on page two of that um, document from today. Um, but I think this really is great stuff, and I just want to uh, appreciate the department staff for uh, putting this together and trying to make uh, the changes that can be made for this year for uh, November again without having to go back to the Secretary of State. Um, and I think this goes a long way. Um, I also agree with the comments that you made about explaining uh, things in advance. I, I'm so old that I remember in the old days when there was a press kit or media kit that was available on election day or a few days before to the media to um, include uh, maps and lists of uh, polling places and an explanation of the reporting schedule. Um, maybe if we're not doing that, we should go back to doing that and post more of that online so that it's got uh, as much of an explainer of um, how the, the system works and when information is available and what information is available, et cetera. So, yes, the more proactive you can be um, on this, the better. And I think the discussion tonight has been helpful. Thanks for listening. Okay. We do have one more caller on the line. It is Mr. Brett Turner. I will unmute you. You have three minutes to comment. Thank you. And thanks again, commissioners. Um, this one is a bit perplexing and, and uh, although I appreciate the niceties thus far, uh, I just want to comment that as someone that's been involved in election reform and uh, election system uh, work for 20 years, um, there's always a next election. So there's always that um, as a response. Um, I agree with everything that's been said here. One thing I want to be aware of uh, is we don't want to normalize these inefficiencies and start thinking that this is business as usual, um, whether it is talking about inoculating the press or the public against these inefficiencies, or whether we're talking about election management systems or the core of the system uh, or, or merely reporting programs. The, the issue at hand is the issue that is the elephant in the room that this, that this county has attempted to grapple with. We really don't care if we have to go back to the Secretary of State 
for uh, more conversation. That's the least of our problems. The bigger problem is that we've got vendors that are referencing our Department of Elections as their personal well-oiled machine, and that these problems are part and parcel to that issue. So Steve Bennett and perhaps even the department itself, they, they don't want any open source around these parts in any way, shape, or form. So that may give some background rationale as to why things move slowly and we can't get anywhere with the open source work and, and we have this inefficiency. Um, we have a problem, proprietary vendors and the, uh, the uh, uh, California Association of Clerks and Election Officials, they don't have a tolerance for open source systems. It takes the money out of some of the areas where they enjoy the money being. And so we have this conflict between monetary forces and the people. So we appreciate this conversation and hope we can push this through. This is one little slice of it, the reporting system, but you see that some folks here locally can whip these systems up that are far superior than anything we've seen from the vendor. So I appreciate your efforts and thank you for your time. I don't see any other hands raised. Great. Okay, um, with that, let's move to agenda item number eight, sole source contracts. Discussion and possible action regarding sole source contracts by the Department of Elections, including the department's September 2021 contract with DFM Associates and how it is reflected in the department's February 2022 proposed budget. Okay, so, um, so this item, it sort of has two parts to it. Um, the first is, Basically, um, it's basically so we can educate ourselves about what what sole source contracts are, and you know the the sole source contracts the department has been um, signing. And this is really something I, I only learned about actually in the past week or two. Um, a several months ago, I learned of, of one sole source contract, but then um, I, I learned a week or two ago that there's actually multiple. So I thought we could spend time you know, learning about them today, but then the second part is I wanted to discuss with the committee basically a process by which we can hear about these um, when they're requested. So basically it could be a, a component of the director's report. And there's nothing inherently bad about sole source contracts, but I think it's, it's good for us as an oversight body for us to learn about them when they're being requested. Um, just so we can know, you know, what are the parts of election management that are that there isn't really a lot of competition around today. So um, the um, so the main the main so I thought maybe what we could do is if Director Arntz, you could just walk us through. Um, it looks like. There were, I guess, eight, eight or nine sole source contracts the department um, signed over the past five years, and maybe just walk us through, you know, what what each one was about, and um, yeah, just you know, just a few sentences or something. And this was in the email that you had replied to me. Yeah, so we signed two sole source contracts with a group called Democracy Live. And that's the vendor that provides the remote accessible vote by mail ballot program. Uh, we use them because that's the only vendor that allows us to retain voter records in house. Uh, otherwise, the vendors uh, have to uh, receive the data and they hold the voter data in their servers. Mm -hmm. So at Democracy Live, we're able to hold the information in house. And also, that when we provide the ballot types to the voters, there's no need for them to identify themselves. There's no need, no need for them to uh, provide any sort of sign in. Uh, password, uh, uh, username, things like that. So that's why we use Democracy Live. Um, DFM. And, and on that one, why, why was that? Why did that one trigger the threshold for a sole source contract? Does it have to be above a certain dollar amount or? No. No? Okay. And so and then I... the DFM is the, is the vendor that provides our election management system. 
we've had uh, one contract, one one extension, and then now we have a second contract. And uh, we originally started a sole source contract with DFM in relation in 2011 in relation and anticipation of the 2012 re, re, pre, redistricting in San Francisco because the current system that we were using then DIMS didn't import the GIS data in, a, in, a, in the same manner that was effective as, as DFM. So we made the, the switch to DFM so we could better create the complete the the reprecinct the redistricting re reprecincting. Um, then the we did an extension for one year and that was and that fell under the same sole, the original sole source from the from the from the original contract because of the dollar amount uh, in the original contract was not to exceed a certain number but it that's that not to exceed amount included services and uh, fee increases that were not used and so when we did the one year amendment in 2020 2021 the not to exceed amount was still under with within the, the the limit of the original contract. Uh, so we didn't do a sole source. We were to, to, to wrap it into that to that contract. Then the new contract uh, we did last year, and we did receive a sole source. And again, it was in contemplation of of redistricting, reprecincting, but also just the, the the fact that we have so many tools built around this this this, this software package uh, that we we saw the sole source because they ripped that program out and then reintroduced something else would have would have been uh, a great amount of work for us. Um, and also with the second contract for DFM, that was a software license essentially with the first contract with DFM was a personal services contract because DFM actually came in the department provided training and they were also on site during during certain times uh, during the original contract term, but the second contract we have, we're only using the, the, the software. We're not having any sort of training or any sort of on-site support at all. Uh, so we didn't have to go the personal services contract way. Um, and then OPEX and Runback, we've had uh, sole source contracts with them. OPEX is the company that provides the, what we call ballot extractors. Those are the machines that open up the vote by mail ballots and we, we pull the ballots out. And then Runback is the company that provides the uh, scanning equipment that we have for the for the vote by mail ballots. Uh, and in both instances, uh, to have any sort of repairs or updates uh, done on that equipment with warranty requires us to, to use those vendors uh, to provide those services. And that's why we have sole source with OPEX and Runback. Okay, and then for each of these, did you need to get the the approval from the office of contract and administration yes yeah, so what is the like tell us what are the thresholds for for that why did you need to get approval for a contract that was only ninety eight thousand for democracy life is it is it above uh, if you go over a thousand hundred thousand dollars there is extra steps you have to take that's that's what we do we and also with with uh democracy live and potentially, we would we would move to the, the Dominion remote accessible vote by mail system, because those ballots that are cast on the Dominion remote accessible vote by mail system don't require remaking. Whereas with the Democracy Live, uh, we have to remake those ballots when they come back to us, and then feed those those remade ballots into the scanners. So, uh, so we and Dominion's been working on their program. We thought that they would potentially have. The program set up to where we would retain the voters information. There'd be no need for special login and and uh, and any sort of username or passwords. For the so voters. if the threshold for getting approval from the OCA is $100,000, then why why did you need to get approval for the democracy live if it was only 98,000? You still need to have OCA approval for all the contracts. Oh, all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. Okay. Um, so I have a couple other questions, but I wanted to turn it over to my fellow committee members, because I imagine this is a new topic for you as well. But. Definitely. Um, thank you. I, I have a question, but did you have an, I just wanted to ask, I understand the, um, the use of the specific, um, like the specific software technology that you're using to. Um, like what they're used for. Uh, what is, how are, 
how is it determined that it there wouldn't be a competitive bid just so I understand the process of determining why you would want a sole source contract beyond just like the budget. One of the items in Commissioner John X uh, handout is the yeah. right. So those items there would be the basis. What, I'm sorry, can you direct me to that? Where on it? I don't know what page is on that. Oh, no problem. I'll just look. And is it the email document? Yeah, so it looks like I see a page. The last page, page five. I'm yeah, see, I'm, I'm seeing one list on page well, five, yeah. five. I don't know. I think it's page five. Yeah, exactly. I think I was, I guess maybe I'm curious specifically about like Democracy Live and some of these other ones. Was it that there wasn't another option that was better? Um, right. For those, so like Democracy Live, for example, obviously you wanted to remove PII, private identifying information, personal identifying information, um, and this was the only type of vendor that offered that. Correct. Got it. Yeah, right. okay. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Is it, did you have any questions? And the same thing for DFM. They were the only, you know, support and maintenance organization that could support the selection management system. Because, there's, because their system is proprietary. So, yeah, so they're the only ones that, that could service it. Or So this, and, and just so that I understand, because I know there are multiple systems here, the elections management system software um, is, is separate from the software that's actually in the Dominion voting right. machines? Right. Okay. So the voter registration records are in the election management system. So everything we do is tied into those records. Mm -hmm. And so like it's, it's the ballots, it's the vote by mail, it's the precincts, it's the notices we send out. So it's, it's all tied in. The tools on our website that we have, like the voter portal, mm -hmm. uh, the wait times at the polling places, uh, that's all, that, right. all that's tied into the election management system. Got it. And uh, so I look at the contract itself and it sounds like even though this is a 10 year contract, uh, which looks like it's paid annually, correct? Mm -hmm. um, that should the elections department find another option in five years, uh, we can cancel at that point. Yeah, so every nearly every contract the city has a termination for convenience clause. And so the city can cancel contracts, but potentially there would be payment mm -hmm. you know, to the vendor. Uh, and, that it, and that would be circumstantial, even though there's no contemplation in this contract for payment if there's termination for, for convenience potentially the, the vendor could bring forward you know discussions or arguments that would the city would provide to pay but that's there's nothing in the contract that provides payment for that for that clause to be exercised right right hmm. just clarifying that we we have options <laughs> yes yeah, so i i have i have two more questions um on this I just on the documents, like on the on the request for the sole source contract for the election management system, you said um, during these ten years the city has expended multi millions of dollars to obtain, implement, and continuously train city employees on the functionality, and that was one of the reasons for um, you know sticking with them because you've already invested so much money. So can you like tell us like what is that? Were they millions of dollars? Of like their time, or was it you were, you paid another company to train them, or what? What is what is that multi million in reference? To? That's that's for our for training all of our the thousands of people that have come to the department through those ten years who use that system that we have trained. Is that um, in addition to the? That's separate than any payment to the vendor. So there's, so any any the vendor's fee is fixed in the contract. And then it was with DFM, they never increased their, their, their fee for the entire term of the first contract. Uh, so it, it was, it never even came close to the not to exceed. So the additional costs were those of the, 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 part, the department or the city bore to train and have people use that system through time. So the, the training is on top, it's in addition to the money from the sole source contract? The... No, so this, this is training the department provided to temporary as needed personnel. Oh. And also new new employees in the department. Okay, and then, um, okay, and then have you also done in house like software development to integrate with the system or or no? We no. Well, 
we create tools on our website. Okay. We create refreshable spreadsheets, but no, we don't develop anything that's associated with the system. Okay. And then the, the second question was, um, one of the questions I asked in my email was, um, you know, where is this annual, the annual money reflected in the budget that we reviewed last, last um, February or March? And then it was under the non-personnel services, which is 11 and a half million um, item. And then it kind of made me wonder, like, I guess maybe it's my own fault, but I never really wondered, like, what is that 11 and a half million and how does it break down? And I was wondering, maybe this is for ourselves, but in future budgets, maybe we can get a breakdown of what is this 11 and a half million figure because I would be interested in seeing, like, you know, what other contracts there are and um, how much of this, you know, I don't really have any sense for what the 11 and a half million is going to. I mean, obviously, the, the 200,000 a year is a small part of that. But um, could you maybe just today tell us a little bit about what what is under the non-personnel services? Is it like the printing costs? Printing or? costs or the yeah, translation costs or the, those are the main ones, ballots. Yeah, so I think just a lot of the bigger, you know, maybe anything above 100,000 or something would be nice to see. Um, yeah, so. So the expenses were broken out in the budget memo in a graph. Um, I guess I remember printing expenses and all that. So are you just wondering which one of those expenses are assigned to the non-personnel services? Yeah, the one that's highlighted in the email. And if you look at page um, one of the email attachment, there's like a highlighted line that says non personnel services, 11.574 million in the proposed budget. Right. But I was just pointing out in the budget memo itself, yeah. there's actually a chart that breaks down the non personnel. Expenses. Well, it breaks out all expenses. Um, well, I don't think. Like, if you look in that chart, you don't see, like, what went to the election management system or what went to the, like, these various contracts, the department, it, it, I don't think it goes to that granularity. Um, which page are you talking about? Um, page 10 of the budget memo, which breaks out um, expenses. So it shows, you know, four and a half million for printing and mailing of election materials. Professionalized and specialized services, five million. So I'm assuming those are the two big components of the non-personnel services. Um, well, I guess I mean I assume the five million it probably breaks down further into different. I mean, I mean, like where in that pie chart is the election management system? I don't know. And what other numbers contribute? Does that make sense? It would be under the professional and specialized services. Yeah. So I guess it's more like just looking ahead, I, I think, you know, just to get a better understanding. Because I guess looking back on the budget, you were really focused on the changes from the previous year rather than the, the costs that remain the same from year to year. That's how the city sets up its budget process. So yeah. it's yeah. reflected in what you receive. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that was my first meeting. <laughs> I had to read this really thick budget memo. So, so I remember, you know, thinking about uh, do I vote for this or not? And then the changes seem, you know, relatively minor. So the, these are kind of ongoing expenses. Um, you know, especially we're negotiating tenure contracts here, but, um, I'm just what I was pointing to this graph just because it might just be a really easy mapping for the budget line items to this graph so that we are just clear, you know, what goes under or not, because it's a big category with 11 and a half million dollars. Yeah. Is, is postage. Include incorporated into that as well. Really? Yeah, I think so. It'd be probably in the printing and, and mailing. Election materials. 
but but President Geronic, you're suggesting that we want the breakout of the professional and specialized services, and yeah, I think we should ask for it. If you want to break that out, but yeah, I mean, I would like to see it even at the contract level, like, you know, two hundred thousand is going towards the DFM contract. Um, you know, one hundred fifty thousand towards the extractor. I mean, just. Just, I, just I've, it's not something I've never seen before. I don't yeah. know really what the money is. I have a question. Why are why are there's why is there no competition for ballot extractors? Why is what? Why are this, there no competition for ballot extractors? Why is that a sole source contract? But there are there are extractors, but the extractors that we use from OPEX can handle the size of the envelope, and so that's and, and we actually and sometimes when we have we had. And prior to this current system, we had bigger, thicker cards, so we had bigger envelopes. Mm -hmm. And so this, these machines could handle that, those bigger envelopes, and they could handle also multi-card ballots in the current size envelope. And so, the, and the sole source comes having any sort of work done on warranty uh, has to be with that vendor. We we could not bring a third party in and have the work be, be warranted. Uh, and then during election, during your, when you're running those machines, you want someone on site right away when those machines need service. So this is all related to the fact that we made a decision on a certain system, elections management or uh, the ballot extractor. And so these are just support and maintenance contracts for that system that we made a decision right. on at some point. Right. Okay, so same answer for the runback scanning equipment. The one of the runback contracts included the the addition of a second scanning unit, so it's it, it, that sole source number is higher than the current contract. The current contract sole source contemplates only service. Okay, so these are just maintenance contracts on. So presumably, when we chose. The scanning equipment or the ballot extractor originally we we had options oh yes we looked we certainly looked i, I don't remember if we went out to bid or not uh but we did informal uh quotes for sure we we then we contact other counties I mean, we didn't just pick opex um and also with on the dfm that, that's just a software license at this point there's no there's no sort of service you know extra service beyond the maintenance of their system, the software side. Okay. And so if we were to find something better, we can stop it at any point. Right. And whatever. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing too, just to know about the DFM contract. Um, and um, I'm not saying this is bad or anything, but like, just is it, Director Ernst, it's true that the contract was structured to be nine years and 364 days? Is that right? Because if it was one day longer, then it would have to go before the board of supervisors. Yeah, and it would take more time. And then we the so we had the original nine year, ten year, whatever it was contract, and we had the one year extension. And then, but and that was during COVID. So we were trying to do this all when people weren't around and and so forth. So the the, the one year extension actually expired. So there was a gap. Between there is a, there was a gap between the expiration of of the extension, and the start of the of the second uh, ten year contract, um, and that we did we, and we had we 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 couldn't take more time to get that contract approved because we were going into the September election. So, okay, and then going forward, I mean, is that something you could do? Like, if you need to have a request for a sole source contract, you could just let us know in your. Monthly report. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm even wondering if incorporated into the budget process, just highlighting the comp the composition of the budget that is allocated towards sole source contracts, um, that might also be mm -hmm. helpful in like getting that level of granularity. So I was thinking, you know, just for the purposes of our committee and commission, I was thinking that, you know, we previously talked about reports we would like to see after elections i was thinking maybe we could have a single document that covers like different areas like under budgets we would like to see hmm. you know if there's a sole source 
contract going to be requested? We'd like to know about that and just have like a kind of one document. Um, and yeah. then it could cover the budget breakdowns that we want to see. I'm just taking a note. Um, on top of what's already provided, but. Are you saying one document that includes all of the things that we want incorporated into the director's reports every month? Is that what you're saying? Including, you know, any sort of budget breakdown or sole source contracts um, that are being reviewed and reporting or am I? Yeah. Well, yeah, understand? well, actually more than that. I was thinking that we could have a single document that's just sort of like, and this is to help future commissioners just basically, these are all the things that we would like the director to provide to the commission on a regular basis. And some of them would be the annual budget, some would be post election, some would be director's reports. Got it. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. Okay. I think that's, is that something that you want to raise through for the whole commission at the next meeting or? Yeah, I was thinking I could, I could put the document together just based on what we talked about today and. We, we could or don't need to vote either way. Yeah. Okay. And um, we could review it at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Great. Was there anything else, President Jordanic, that you wanted to incorporate into the discussion around sole source contracts? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that covers it all. Just thank you for being able to spend time on it. I know it's getting later, but. I know I, I have to take uh, the responsibility for that because I think racial equity took a lot longer. So I apologize for taking the majority of that time, um, but I appreciate the conversation because it's very important. Um, let's take uh, any um, public comment. Okay, Mr. Kiltow, I will admit you and you have three minutes to comment on sole source contracts. Can you hear me now? Yes, uh, there's the mic. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, on this issue, I, I think I agree with uh, president uh, Jordanic on the last point about uh, reporting. I think it's important to distinguish between. Those reports that the commission wants um, on a monthly basis as part of the director's report, those things that are pre election that are appropriate in a memo or in the election plan, those things that are post election retrospective that, um, as I said earlier, I think should be in a cover memo um, describing how the election plan rolled out um, and then other uh, reports um, as needed, whether it's the, um, a waiver request for other staff to assist with elections or what's included in the level of detail in the budget every year, um, perhaps the opportunity to um, discuss this is after um, President Jordanic brings uh, the list uh, next time, wherever, whenever, uh, but also uh, to review that as a public document in public open session um, when you do the annual review of the director's performance. And so you can say, okay, here are the things that we've asked for uh, every month. Uh, did we get it? Was it great? Da -da -da, whatever. And then you can say, okay, for the next year, let's look at, you know, not reporting on this thing because we don't care anymore or adding these other two things because suddenly we do care. Um, those are my thoughts about uh, reporting. I will also try to work with uh, um, Martha after the meeting to communicate anything that I missed uh, on an earlier item. Thanks for listening. More fun at your next meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we have Mr. Brent Turner. Mr. Turner, you have three minutes to con to comment on sole source contracts. That's me. Hello. There you go. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks again for for uh, working into the late hour here. Um, the public is not quite as um, uh, pleasant about this one. Um, you, obviously, we all know that the law prescribes strict guidelines for sole source uh, contracts. Um, some of these 
responses with all due respect to the to, to the head of the department. Uh, but it almost sounds reverse engineered when, when I hear about um, uh, warranty clauses and things that could have been dealt with um, at the inception of the previous contracts used as justification for putting more bad money into systems that we know are suffering from severe vendor lock-in with price gouging and inefficiency. And now we're putting more public money in there without regard for the available solutions. So th this is, I think, a breach of duty. And uh, there should be compelling reasons for the avoidance of the sole source card guidelines. It should be that the providing vendor is the only game in town. And that's not the case here. And that there's some compelling urgency, which I don't think has been shown. As I stated previously, there's always another election. And of course, we have to move swiftly, but we need to be paying extra attention on this because this vendor lock in creates the situation that we're now in with Dominion and now with this election management company. Um, I think one of the commissioners mentioned if we had something better, we could back out. Well, I think we need to pay attention to uh, escape clauses and opt out clauses again during the initiation stage. And I'm very suspect when the threshold is 10 million and the contract is 9.9 .9 million, or it's 10, if it's 10 years, it's over the threshold. So the contract is nine years and 364. Mr. Turner, you're at the 30 second mark. Thank you. Um, I think the rest is obvious, but the public has extreme concern here, and we hope that uh, we get to the bottom of some of these issues. Thank you again for your time. We have no other callers? Okay, I don't think we have anything else to vote on, so... Um... It is 9.02 p.m. and I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.